Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so glad to be here with all of you tonight. Um, should be yet another late night chat. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. Uh, should be a good conversation. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's do this thing. All right, there we go. There we go. Let's do it. The American century. I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Everything would be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the mass. We need a government of action. Welcome, everybody. So glad to have you all here tonight. Um, yeah, this is just just another late night conversation. Um, the way we do things, for those of you who may not be familiar, I give these opening remarks, kind of what I'm doing now. Uh, then uh, the whole time I'm giving these remarks, uh, your questions are coming in. They're coming in on Rumble Rants. They're coming in on Rockfin Tips. They're coming in as Super Chats, and they're added to the list. And then... After that, after that, then um, at that point, uh, we then do a roll call uh, where we call you all out as I see you, names and locations. We find out who is on the other side of the camera. And then after that, after that, um, phew, um, after that, I then answer your questions for the rest of the night. And we tend to go pretty late here, and that's fine. A lot of people watch this uh, the next day, the following day. But those of you who are watching now are the lucky ones because you have the ability to guide the conversation however you would like it to go. And so I encourage you to use that power. Send me a question that'll get me going, that'll get me talking. I am here to engage with all of you. And it should be a great conversation. So glad to have you all here. Um, yeah, we're just gonna gonna chat now. A quick announcement I do want to make before we get too far into this. Um, my mind at this point is fully occupied by the tremendous success that the Center for Political Innovation is going to have at our upcoming conference in Portland. Um, this is going to be the biggest conference that the Center for Political Innovation has ever done. Our Austin conference had over 100 people. This one is going to have 250 people there. That is the auditorium that we have booked. It is for 250 people. We are going to fill this auditorium. Um, it's going to be awesome. Uh, it's already reserved. Uh, the space is already reserved. The venue is already reserved. The night before, uh, Jyoti Brar of the Communist Party of Great Britain Marxist-Leninist, uh, she'll be given a talk uh, with the World Anti-Imperialist Platform the night before while having a forum. Then she'll be speaking, giving a short presentation at the actual conference. Um, uh, there's going to be music. The music of David Rovix will be performed. Uh, there's going to be Scott Ritter, the great uh, former UN weapons inspector, anti-imperialist voice, military analyst. He's going to be there. Um, it's looking to be really awesome. Uh, you know, Rainer Shea is going to be there. Um, Jyoti Brar is going to be there. It's going to be pretty, pretty exciting. It's going to be a great event. Libertarians, uh, People's Party, uh, you name it. Party of Communists USA. Chris Alali is coming to town for it. It's going to be a smashing event, and we are, we are very excited about it. Um, however, uh, you know, uh, we need money. Uh, we, I mean, there's no way to, to not, you know, not, just come out and say that, you know, we're a little worried about how we're going to pay for everything. We're going to have buses from Seattle to bring people in. Uh, we've been talking to people with the Russian Community Center out there. We've been talking to people with the John Reed Center and uh, the various organizations out there. We're going to have buses from Northern California. We've been talking to people from Northern California. 
Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to need people to help us do it. Um, we'd rather you donate directly to the CPI. Uh, this goes directly. These are the, the accounts managed by Elizabeth Young, the president of the Center for Political Innovation, who lives out in Portland. She's been organizing all of this, reserving the spaces. She just sent me, sent me some spaces today for the Friday night meeting. And look, this is going to be a fantastic, uh, fantastic event. And really, it's, it's a lot of events that are happening. Early December in Portland, Oregon is going to be Wow. Um, you know, um, it's going to be something special. Let me just put it that way. Um, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be something special. Uh, we're doing Friday night. We're doing the meeting of the world anti-imperialist platform with Joe T. Brar. Saturday will be the all day mega anti-imperialist conference. Uh, you know, uh, there's going to be a gathering on Sunday. Uh, and then, uh, the following weekend, uh, we are going to do a, uh, a weekend workshop uh, with classes, a kind of weekend re workshop discussion classes for new members of the Center for Political Innovation, December 8th, 9th, and 10th, the following weekend. Um, it looks like, um, you know, we are also going to be doing some activities during the week uh, between the conference and the weekend workshop, uh, because a lot of people will be staying in town. I'm going to be doing a, a public speaking workshop uh, to teach people the, the art of public speaking. We're going to have some impromptu protests around Portland uh, that won't be publicized ahead of time, but some small symbolic protests, uh, you know, ahead of, uh, ahead of, um, the, uh, the conference or uh, after the conference uh, and lead up to the weekend workshop. It's going to be really exciting. Uh, we basically have got a pretty solid block of great activities planned for Portland, Oregon. Uh, the biggest of which will be our national convention, dare to win world beyond imperialism, the Center for Political Innovation National Convention set for Portland, Oregon, December 2nd. It's going to be a mega all-day anti-imperialist rally. So um, if you want to you want to help us out, uh, the best thing to do uh, would be to give directly to the Center for Political Innovation Stripe uh, account. Uh, that's from the website. There's the link uh, if you want to help us out. Uh, but the main thing is we need you there. We need you there. Uh, so if you're a member of the Center for Political Innovation or a friend or an ally or just somebody who'd like to come see the show uh, or come engage with what people have to say, I would recommend booking your ticket immediately. Uh, planes, trains and automobiles, Greyhound buses, Amtrak, uh, airlines, you name it. Um, I would recommend booking your tickets immediately. Um, and uh, we got to do this. You know, uh, we, we got two months, which is not a short time. So we have plenty of time to build this. Um, but we really need this to be an epic, epic event to close out the year of 2023. And the logistics, I am on the phone all day talking to somebody about it, whether I'm talking to Elizabeth in Portland, whether I'm talking to our web outreach team that are doing great work, whether I'm talking to uh, different organizations that are going to be represented there. Uh, there's a lot that's going into this, but we are making sure this is going to be the biggest event that the Center for Political Innovation has ever done. And it's going to be on the West Coast. And we don't do much on the West Coast. We've had a number of events on the East Coast. We had an event in Austin, Texas. We did have a little uh, conference in Los Angeles a couple of years back, uh, kind of a mini conference. This is going to be the biggest thing we've done. Uh, oh, wow. Mar Mariah just gave 50 bucks, um, you know, um, and we appreciate that, Mariah. And, you know, we're doing this, um, you know, now. Obviously, after we do this, uh, we'll have we'll have more conferences in different parts of the country. But I really, you know, 2023 uh, is very much the year of the comeback for the Center for Political Innovation, because at the end of 2022, um, you know, we we suffered a, a very vicious attack uh, that resulted in a temporary shutdown of the organization. And we rebounded from that amazingly. Uh, we rebounded from from our temporary shutdown amazingly. We had our you know sponsorship and our reception to the Rage Against the War Machine protest. We then had our our summit against hypocrisy that was amazing in Washington D.C. We then, after that, had an amazing uh, weekend retreat workshop. Uh, then, after that, we had our July 10th event um, in New York City, and that was amazing. Um, and now uh, we want to close out the year of 2023 with an epic conference, a conference that will be remembered 
in the history of American anti-imperialism as a turning point, right? Because already the tide is turning. Let me just make this clear. The tide is already turning. Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, made a secret deal to make sure he could send more weapons and funding to Ukraine. And now he is the first Speaker of the House in history to be ousted. In order to prevent a government shutdown, the U.S. Congress passed a 47-day extension of the U.S. federal budget, and it did not include any more money for Ukraine. And the Democratic Party was seething with anger about it, so much so that Jamal Bowman pulled the fire alarm in hopes of preventing the vote, in hopes of making sure the government did shut down rather than not give money to Ukraine. The public is with us. People don't want us wasting more money on this foreign war. The intelligence community is starting to shift. Uh, it's been revealed by Seymour Hirsch that they know Zelensky has no plan for victory. There is no way that Ukraine will ever drive Russia out of Crimea, drive Russia out of the eastern, uh, the new republics. Not going to happen. And so at this point, this is just a scam, a money-making scheme, so that more money can be dumped into a corrupt regime in Ukraine, and they can siphon off more money for themselves while lives are thrown away. Russian lives and Ukrainian lives are thrown away in the conflict. Um, the public is overwhelmingly tired of this. The economy is suffering. We're getting ready for a presidential election in the United States that is going to be a circus. It's going to be a complete circus. And when it comes to shifting the tide of public opinion in the United States, when it comes to changing how people view prolonging this war, um, we're winning. But I think it was one of Donald Trump's uh, children. She, they said that Donald Trump's Trump always taught them you never quit while you're ahead. Right? Because that's a thing that we grow up hearing, right? Quit while you're ahead, right? Oh, you're winning. End the game there. Uh, but if you do that, life doesn't end. Things keep going. And if you quit while you're ahead, sometimes uh, you will not secure your victory. And uh, so. My urging is that because we are winning at this point, because what was said at the Rage Against the War Machine rally is majority opinion, right? Because the fact that what uh, what was, you know, the, the fact that this Ukrainian Nazi who spoke at the Canadian Parliament is not just being condemned by myself and RT and Scott Ritter, but rather he's being condemned by the entire establishment in Canada. They're all coming together to say how wrong it was to cheer for him. And it's come, become a scandal in Canada uh, that this Nazi was in the parliament. I mean, this is big. The tide is turning when it comes to World War III. The demand of the American people, the demand of the world is for de-escalation. We are winning. And because we are winning, And because we are winning, that's why we need to end the year of 2023 with an epic conference. We need to pull all the stops out, right? We need to deliver the knockout, right? We're already winning. The enemy is on the ropes, but it's time to rear back and deliver that effective knockout. And that's what this conference will be. They see a huge auditorium. chanting in support of cutting off funding to Ukraine, chanting against World War III, chanting in solidarity with the people of the world for development, for truth. That 
will be a victory. It's hard to have big protests in the winter time. It's it's winter. Everyone's cold. People want to stay indoors and you know you know huddle up and stay warm with their family, etc. This is an indoor event. It's going to be an indoor event, huge auditorium near near Portland, Oregon. Um, but we need to do everything we can. It, we need to gather all the forces that could possibly be gathered. We need to fill that auditorium. As Terry, who's out there in Portland, says, Americans are tired of this ish. And uh, they are. They're tired of it. We're all tired of it. And if we can give voice to these widespread sentiments, if we can be an entity, the Center for Political Innovation, that gathers people and organizes and gives voice to what Americans are feeling in their bones, if we can do this, we can position ourselves to be much more influential in other debates that, that come around. And we can build our organization, right? Because we are building a solid core of dedicated people people who understand what this is about, people who are looking for the brotherhood and sisterhood and the community that comes through being a revolutionary. Not everybody is ready for this, but we we have an organization of people. We have 122 dues-paying members as of this moment, and we believe that we can recruit at least 20 more members out of this upcoming Portland operation. 20 more members will sign up and join the Center for Political Innovation as a result of this operation. The amount of outreach we are planning to do in the area is massive. And we are convinced that we can have a good event. We're really convinced we can do it. So, you know, um, we need your support. We need you to come to the conference uh, and make your travel arrangements. Uh, you know, we need you to uh, we need you to donate to help us run, you know, have the conference. That would be good. We need you to donate. Uh, we also need your support to help us promote it, right? We want every college campus out there to know this is happening. We want every um, every local resident and community group to know this is happening. Uh, we have plans for massive door-to-door -door outreach in the neighborhoods and the communities uh, where this conference is happening. This is really a big endeavor. We've had conferences before. We had a little conference and in uh in in california once we had a little we we, we had our, our conference in austin it was about 100 maybe 120 people we had our conference in chicago it was about 75 people uh you know we we've had different conferences in different parts of the country but this will by far be the biggest event we have ever done and we want that auditorium to be full of new people new people who've never heard our message right um i I actually, I want to tonight, and I guess this is my opening remarks that have already started. I made my announcement, but this is really opening remarks that I'm doing here. Um, you know, I, I was recently going over um, with comrades in the Center for Political Innovation. We were doing some kind of political education about where the synthetic left came from, et cetera. Um, you know, and we have a whole understanding of the Congress for Cultural Freedom and George Soros and all of that stuff. But, um, you know, sometimes you just have to go back to Lenin. You know, what Lenin said a hundred years ago about all of this, um, you know, what Lenin said 100 years ago, it, it it's a pretty good explanation, uh, you know, um, and it fits with what people ought to be saying now. So I'm going to pull up a couple quotes from Vladimir Lenin that I recently shared with Center for Political Innovation members in a chat group. And I figured they would just be worth talking about tonight. Right? A hundred years ago, 100 years ago, uh, in the lead up to World War One, it was over a hundred years ago, um, Lenin was furious. Vladimir Lenin was absolutely furious because World War I broke out and 20 million workers were sent to their deaths. And Lenin knew that if the socialists and communists of Germany and France and Belgium and Britain and elsewhere had, had stood up, they could have stopped the war, but they didn't stop the war. And so Lenin wrote a very important essay called Imperialism and the Split in Socialism. 
Um, it's a very, very important essay in which he explains why it was uh, that the socialist movement of Europe failed to stop World War I. It's a very important essay, and I would recommend that you read it um, if you get a chance. It is a, a very good summary of Lenin's, uh, Lenin's uh, book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. If you want a condensed understanding what imperialism is and how it affects the communist movement, you know, it's a good place to start. Um, but in that essay, there are a couple passages that I think are very, very, they just directly apply to what we are talking about today. This is one. On the economic basis referred to above, the political institutions of modern capitalism, the press, the parliament associations, the congresses, etc., have created political privileges and sops for the respectful, meek, reformist, and patriotic office employees and workers, corresponding to the economic privileges and SOPs, lucrative and soft jobs in government or on war industries committees, in parliament and on diverse committees, on the editorial staffs of respectable legally published newspapers, or on the management councils of no less respectable bourgeois law-abiding trade unions, this is the bait by which the imperialist bourgeoisie attracts and rewards the representatives and supporters of bourgeois labor parties. Now, what is he saying there? Basically, he's describing how the socialist movement back in his day became supportive of imperialism through a process of bribery. Jenny Lynn says it right. Could so easily have been written today. Right? All those NGO jobs, those cushy jobs at NGOs, all these staff positions in the labor bureaucracy, the law-abiding trade unions, all the you know the jobs at the New York Times and Jacobin, respectable legally published newspapers. All right. The SOPs for the reformist and patriotic office employees, that whole NGO laptop class. That urban middle class of college graduates with lots of debt who work at a startup company or a nonprofit or a, a labor union or Planned Parenthood or the Center for Constitutional Rights or some activist -y liberal job who get a decent paycheck to do social justice work. That is the modern bourgeois labor party. The labor unions themselves, right? Labor unions themselves, SEIU and right, AFSCME and and um, oh, there's so many of them. Right, these staff positions. If you're going to work at one of those places, you can't get canceled for being pro Russia. You can't get canceled for questioning allegations about Syria. Those people's political views are policed more than anybody. If you want a position, a, a position on the the editorial staff of a respectable newspaper or the management council of a law abiding trade union. If you want to be a respectful, meek, reformist, patriotic office employee, they have mechanisms for making sure that you align with U.S. foreign policy. And in fact, these people have become the front line of U.S. foreign policy. Wars are waged by these people. Ukraine is portrayed as a heroic national liberation struggle. They've hired a transgender individual to be their spokesperson. 
right? They got rainbow flags for Ukraine. Right? This is the mechanism through which the socialist movement has been turned into a social imperialist movement. It is not fighting to overthrow Western capitalism. It is a necessary mechanism for stabilizing Western capitalism. This is what Lenin came to understand. Social democracy, the democratic socialists of America, the reformist sellout trade union leadership, the all of it, the socialist apparatus of the West, which got significantly rolled back at the end of the Cold War because it was no longer necessary. Um, but now we're seeing it being amped up more than ever. Social democracy is a necessary element for maintaining imperialism. So what did Vladimir Lenin say to do? What did he say to do? He said, oh, well, get a job at one of these places and form a faction and maneuver within it, like Freedom Road Socialist Organization. Ah. What did Vladimir Lenin say to do? He said, well, uh, you know, you join one of these places, you get a job at one of these places, and then uh, what you do is you uh, you join the Communist Party and you pretend that you're a, a revolutionary. Ah, that is not what Vladimir Lenin said to do. Vladimir Lenin said, oh, well, you, you work at one of these places um, and you read Jacobin with your coworkers and sometimes you insert a pro-Russian talking point in there, but man, ah, that is not what you do. Later in his essay, Imperialism, the Split, and Socialism, Vladimir Lenin gave a very clear answer about what to do about the fact that the bourgeois labor party, the social imperialist apparatus has been created and is leading the workers and the progressive-minded people to war. What did he say to do about it? And this has become a mantra on these streams. I, I quote this in speeches and lectures and live streams all the time, but it's so important. This is what Vladimir Lenin said to do. He says, Engels draws a distinction between the bourgeois labor party of the old trade unions, the privileged minority, and the lowest mass, the real majority and appeals to the latter, who are not infected by bourgeois respectability. This is the essence of Marxist tactics. Now, what is that? What is that? That first paragraph there. So you have the bourgeois labor party, the reformist trade unions, the NGOs, the respectable office workers, all of that. You have that. And then you have the lowest mass, the lowest mass. The working class people that are hungry, that are trying to feed their bills, they, they don't work at Planned Parenthood. They don't work at they don't work at SEIU, you know, as national headquarters. You know, they don't they don't work at uh, Students Against Sweatshops or the Center for Constitutional Rights. They don't work at the Democratic Party Troll Farm Club. The lowest mass, the real majority and appeals to the latter who are not infected by bourgeois respectability. What is bourgeois respectability? That's another word for political correctness, right? When you work at one of these respectable trade union jobs, you learn, well, we, we don't, you know, we all start our meeting by going around and saying our pronouns, he, he, her, they, them, you know, and, and uh, we don't, we don't say that here. And, and we use this kind of, you know, go to the lowest mass. Do you think when on the streets of Harlem, people are talking that way? Do you think that in the hills of West Virginia, people are talking that way? No. The lowest mass, the real majority, who are not infected by bourgeois respectability. And here we get to the most, one of the most important paragraphs ever written in the history of Marxism. Neither we nor anyone else can calculate precisely what portion of the proletariat is following and will follow the social chauvinists and opportunists. This will be revealed only by the struggle, and it will definitely be decided only by the socialist revolution. But we know for certain that the defenders of the fatherland, the supporters of imperialism, in imperialist war represent only a minority. And it is therefore our duty, if we wish to remain socialists, 
to go lower and deeper to the real masses. It is therefore our duty, if we wish to remain socialists, meaning the people who don't do this have stopped being socialists, it is therefore our duty, if we wish to remain socialists, to go down lower and deeper to the real masses. This is the whole meaning and the whole purport of the struggle against opportunism by exposing the fact that the opportunists and the social chauvinists are in reality betraying and selling the interests of the masses. They are defending the temporary privileges of a minority of workers, that they are the vehicle of bourgeois ideas and influences that they are in reality agents and allies of the bourgeoisie, we teach the masses to appreciate their true political interests and to fight for socialism and for the revolution all through the long and painful vicissitudes of imperialist war and imperialist armistices. We have no interest in recruiting the staff or the readership of Jacobin. We have no interest in recruiting the staff or the leadership of the National Nurses Association or the Service Employees International Union or the Federation of Teachers of America. We have no interest in recruiting the people who work on laptops to design the emails from Nancy Pelosi to ask you to donate $20 to help impeach Donald Trump. We have no interest in the peop- trying to recruit the people who write the press releases for Planned Parenthood. We have no interest in that. We want to go down lower and deeper to the real masses, which brings me to something that got a lot of attention in conservative media uh, this spring. At the beginning of this year, there was an event that happened that got very, very little attention outside of conservative media. But it got a lot of attention in conservative media. And I, I want you to, to know about it, right? Um, I, because it's conservative media, I'll, I'll put on someone we all think is obnoxious, Ben Shapiro. And I'll have Ben Shapiro explain to you what happened. This was Ben Shapiro's video about what happened, right? Again, um, it got very, very little attention in mainstream media. It was highlighted in conservative circles. But I saw it at the time, and I said, this is the face of things to come. This is the beginning. This is the face of things to come, um, and uh, I, I want you all to be aware of it. This is who we need to be talking to. And I, you know, um, I, I'm just waiting for the video to download, so just hold on, right? I got to show you videos. Sometimes these lives are a little bit spontaneous. I don't plan absolutely everything I'm going to say. And because of that, um, I have to download videos. But I'm, I'm the video is almost ready here. I just got to show this video on the screen here. So, open file. Dun, dun, dun. Um, this is Ben Shapiro talking about something. This is a video he made February twenty fifth, um, February twenty fifth, twenty twenty three, at the beginning of this year, while this was happening. It got very little attention in the mainstream press. I talked about it on these streams because I pay attention to these kinds of things. This is extremely important, and I want you all to see this. Um, I want you all to to pay attention to this, because even though the actual event itself ended, this is the face of things to come, right? This was an experiment, and there will be more like it. There will be more like it. I can I can almost guarantee you that, right? But we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared. Um, so, yeah, if I can pull up Ben Shapiro's video. Oh, goodness gracious, if it ever 
Uh, doo -doo -doo. I'm just waiting. All right, here's Ben Shapiro talking about it. Some things I like and then some things that I hate. So things that, that I like today. There's been this amazing event that apparently has happened before at Asbury University. They had a 24-7 revival meeting. It's called the Asbury Revival. And it's drawn tens of thousands of people, like 50,000 people to this tiny Kentucky town over the course of 13 days just to pray. It's not political. It's not like a big Trump event. It's not like a big right wing event. It's just a bunch of people who came to a church. And then over the course of two weeks, essentially, they just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. The fact that this is not drawn kind of intense media coverage is kind of shocking in the sense that it is a media story when 50,000 people descend on a very small town just to pray and, and find communion with each other and God like that. That's an amazing thing. I guess it's not that amazing. The media won't cover it because if they had been doing 50,000 people arriving for a 13 day orgy, then the media would be all over it. Right. Then the media would be like, ah, this is what American society must be. When people show up to have some good, clean, wholesome prayer with one another and and in conjunction with religion. That, that's a bad thing, and we can't really pay that much attention to it. But it is an amazing, amazing thing. And the footage from the Asbury Revival is incredible. According to Fox News, the Marathon Worship Service at Asbury University that has drawn tens of thousands of participants from across the country is now being forced to downsize because school officials are saying that it's causing logistical issues for the surrounding area. It's now going to need to move off of campus. The movement began after students actually refused to leave after a chapel service last Wednesday. The services have since grown to pack the school's chapel with worshipers from all over the country. Now, apparently there is a history to this. There's a professor at Asbury who, who talks about this. He's a piece over Christianity Today talking about the, the situation over there. Apparently, students are required to attend a certain number of prayer services, it's a religious school. Um, and uh, this has happened before where people have, have shown up and then refused to leave because they were feeling the spirit so much. And here's how the professor describes it. Some were reading and reciting scripture. Others were standing with arms raised. Several were clustered in small groups praying together. A few were kneeling at the altar rail in front of the auditorium. Some were lying prostrate. Others were talking to one another, their faces bright with joy. They were still worshiping when I left late in the afternoon. And when I came back in the evening, they were still worshiping when I arrived early Thursday morning. And by mid-morning, hundreds were filling the auditorium again. I've seen multiple students running toward the chapel each day. By Thursday evening, there were standing room only. Students had begun to arrive from other universities, University of Kentucky, University of the Cumberlands, Purdue, Indiana Wesleyan, Ohio Christian University, Transylvania University, Midway, Lee University, Georgetown College, Mount Vernon Nazarene University, and many others. He said, some are calling this a revival. I know in recent years, that term has become associated with political activism, but let me be clear, no one at Asbury actually has that agenda. Apparently, Asbury does have a history with revivals, including one that took place in 1905 and one in 2006, when a student chapel led to four days of continuous worship, prayer, and praise. The, it's... You know, the, the fact is that religion requires community. One of the things that we have done by reducing religion to spirituality is we have suggested that what religion really is about is your internal feeling of solidity with God. That is not really what religion is about. Religion does include that component, but that is not the entirety of religion. Religion requires you to commune with others. It is why it happens in churches. It is why in the Talmud, it says that God rests where there are 10 people, where there are 10 men praying together. That's, that's You have to have 10 men to form a minyan, right, in order to do certain aspects of Jewish prayer for each prayer service, we pray three times a day. The idea that a community is built around a common cause is what has allowed the growth of civilization. So just evolutionarily speaking, human beings have a very hard time congregating above a certain number. If you, you can't have that many people on the same page without a higher cause. Otherwise, they tend to break down into tribes, they tend to break down into families. What religion did, historically speaking, is it allowed people to abstract up the chain because now you can get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people on the same page because they were worshiping the same God and aiming for the same thing. And there is something euphoric about worshiping with tens of thousands of other people. I've done it myself. When I, when I go to the Kotel on a Friday night, the, the Western Wall on a Friday night in Israel, in Jerusalem, there is that feeling of we are all here together and we're all doing the same thing and we are all oriented toward a higher purpose. That is a good thing. And that hole in the spirit is filled in our society by either nothing, which is leading to rising tides of chaos, despair, loneliness, or it's filled with really bad causes. People tend to fill it with politics. Politics tends to fill that, that void for a lot of people. And suddenly you're looking at political utopianism, which is why you see all of these sort of very radical political agendas that are driven forward by a feeling of community. That's why a Bernie Sanders rally, for example, turns into almost a religious revival worship service very often. You know, people need that in their lives. People want to feel that feeling of belonging, a feeling of higher purpose, and a feeling they're part of something bigger than themselves. 
when that is oriented towards something proper, like a relationship with God, a God who calls on you to be moral and good toward your fellow man, that is an amazing, amazing thing. What I'm hoping is that what's happening at Asbury is the forerunner to a broader religious revival, because let's be frank about this. Without religion, society in the West is going to die. It is just that simple. The reason being, secularism cannot uphold. Anyway, you get it. We don't have to listen to Ben the jerk for too long. But I I, I have some footage, actually. Um, you know, this, as things in the United States deteriorate, uh, and they will deteriorate in the heartland of the country, in the Midwest, in rural areas, uh, we're going to see a lot more events like Asbury, right? And I am far more interested, when Lenin talked about going lower and deeper to the real masses, he was talking about the kind of people that would be at Asbury. Um, and I, I'm going to show you some of the footage here. Uh, if, if, you know, I mean, a lot of what Ben said in that clip was absolutely right. I mean, you know, and what he was saying, why people are doing this. So here's some footage from the event. Yeah, so this is, you know, this is what we're going to see a lot more of uh, in the coming months, right? And this is where the real masses go when they are struggling and suffering. You know, the people who don't, you know, who don't have the luxury of joining the laptop class, the people who don't have the luxury of, of you know, joining the... Uh, joining the pink haired college debt elite uh, who manage social media and decide what we should think. The real masses, as they are struggling and suffering in the heartland of the country, this is where they go. Um, you know, and we need to find a way to relate to the real masses. And, you know, we need, we need to reorient the Center for Political Innovation uh, to become an organization that can recruit people, uh, that can recruit people. And when I talk about out of the movement to the masses, this is what I'm talking about. On, on the one hand, I'm talking about out of the regular left, out of the mainstream of the left. Um, that's, you know, the first thing. I mean, we want to get away from Jacobin. We want to get away from Planned Parenthood. We want to get away from the labor bureaucracy. We want to get away from the DSA, the DSA and the ISO and, bread tube and all of that, right? We want to get away from that. On the other hand, we want to get off the internet, right? You'll notice all these people could be at home watching the live stream, but they're there for a reason, right? They came there because they want the IRL in real life sense of community. They're suffering. They're, you know, their, their communities are falling apart. Uh, they're angry. And religion is the vehicle through which they can express their emotions. Um, you know, the Center for Political Innovation needs to go lower and deeper to the real masses. And that is not going to be easy. And that is not going to be, you know, easy at all. Honestly, it's going to be difficult. But we need to reorient our organization toward being an IRL in real life organization that goes lower and deeper to the real masses and gives them the sense of community that you just saw in that video. That is what we need to do. We need to become a vehicle through which the mass sentiments of opposition to war, opposition to poverty, opposition to deindustrialization, opposition to wages going down are expressed. We need to go lower and deeper to the real masses. As our country is deteriorating, as people are being alienated from each other, we need to build the movement, not the social media brand, 
not the intellectual exercise, the movement. We need to build the movement that will give expression to what is becoming the majority sentiment in America right now, which is opposition. Opposition to war, opposition to the status quo. This is what we need to be doing, right? This is where we need to be. This is what needs to happen. Out of the movement to the masses. And when I say out of the movement to the masses, I mean out of the left, but I also mean off the internet. Because I am looking forward to the day I can take this YouTube channel down. Um, you know, because this is great. And I mean, I'm not going to stop streaming. But I want to only stream for those of you who, who appreciate what we're doing. Every, every night there's a bunch of, you know, jackasses in the chat. You know, there's a lot of great people in the chat too. But there's often a lot of jackasses. Um, and the, the, the internet has become a psychological mind control operation. Uh, it really has become that. Right. And it is an elaborate one. Right. It first it's designed to make sure you don't become a dissident. Then it's designed to track your motions. And if you're still going to be a dissident, they make you their kind of dissident. And then if you can't be their kind of dissident, then they make sure that all you do, all you do uh, is that you just stay on the Internet fighting with people all day. And they, they direct you in that direction. And that there is just such an elaborate effort. To make sure. That nobody goes and does what needs to be done. And we need to just do it. Right? I used to tell a joke. This is a joke I told years ago as I was leaving the Workers' World Party. I was getting so fed up with the Workers' World Party. I haven't told this joke in a long time, but I'm going to tell it now. I think it's very appropriate. I told the joke about there was a man. There was a man who dreamed that he needed to hire a communist to work at his law firm. That was what he dreamed. Um, and so he went to the Communist Party office and he said, I'd like to hire a few of your members to file papers at my office. So he hired three people from the Communist Party. He took them to his law office where all the papers were. And he says, all right, I need you to file the papers. And then he came back at the end of the day and the papers were all exactly where they started. And then he said, why didn't you guys file the papers? And they said, well, you know, uh, the House of Representatives is still under the control of the Republicans. And, you know, Donald Trump, you know, didn't you see January 6th? Um, you know, he stormed the Capitol. And, you know, maybe if we can take back full control of Congress, if we can win the 2024 election, maybe then we can file the papers. And he said, oh, come on. He said, that's ridiculous. Got rid of them. He went and he went to a, a very radical protest rally, he found found somebody from the, the Revolutionary Communist Party, found someone from a Trotskyite group, Socialist Alternative, and he said, all right, you guys, you guys look like real communists. Those other guys were just jokers. You guys, you can file my papers. So he takes them to his office, shows them all the papers. He says, all right, file my papers. Goes away, comes back at the end of the day. They're not there, but the papers are gone. So he goes, he's like, where did they go? And he goes outside of his office and they're out on the street and they've got stacks of his papers and they're trying to sell them to people. They're like, here, buy his papers. And he's like, I didn't want you to sell my papers. I wanted you to file my papers. And they're like, well, we made, you know, we made $2.50 selling your papers. I got a guy's phone number. We're going to go have coffee with him later. And he's like, no, 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 no. Don't, I, this is ridiculous. He said, he got, gets rid of them. So then he goes to another communist group. Workers' World Party, Party of Socialism and Liberation. And he says, all right, you guys look like you're serious. You guys look like you're serious. Takes them to the office, says, file my papers. Goes away. Comes back at the end of the day. The papers are all still there, not filed. But then next to the papers, there's a leaflet. And he looks at the leaflet. And the leaflet says, says rally in Times Square to file the papers. 
And he's like, oh, shit. And he goes to Times Square. And there's a protest cage set up. With, you know, police around it. There's a big sound system set up and a stage. There's a bunch of people with signs. And they're all chanting, file the papers. File the papers. File the papers. And then a Palestinian gets up and says, the fight to free Palestine is the fight to file the papers. And everyone goes, yay. Then a transgender person gets up and says, the fight of the transgender people is the fight to file the papers. And everyone goes, yay. And he walks up to the, the communist he, he hired and he says, what is wrong with you guys? What in the world is wrong with you guys? I've, I've gone to three different groups of communists. None of you can just manage to file the papers. And the communist from the Party of Socialism and Liberation Workers World gets very angry. Says, how dare you? How dare you? All those other groups, they just talked about filing the papers. But we're the ones that actually did something. Um, and that's true. That, and that's my joke. And, and all of these communist groups, none of them will file the goddamn papers. None of them will do it. The Communist Party is campaigning for the Democrats. Uh, the RCP is selling Bob Avakian's books and, you know, putting on street theater. You know, they're following around right now. The, the Bob Avakian RCP people, they're following around the country singer who did try that in a small town. Uh, they're following him around uh, and they are burning flags outside of his concerts. That is what they are doing. That is their activism at the moment. Um, you know, um, you know. Um, yeah, that is what they're doing. So there you go. Anyhow, that's what they're doing. And uh, if you look at, you know, the Party of Socialism and Liberation, they've been organizing protests for abortion for the last few years. Uh, you know, uh, if you look at the, uh, you know, you, you look at any of these communist groups, I mean, they are, they are just hailing the liberals and they won't go lower and deeper to the real masses. Going lower and deeper to the real masses. That is what we should be doing. Going lower and deeper to the real masses. That is what we should be doing. And no one wants to do it because it's it's hard. Because it's not going to be immediately rewarding. Because it's, you know, it's it's resulted in, you know, me getting canceled. It, but that is what we have to do. We must go lower and deeper to the real masses. That's what we need to do. Lower and deeper to the real masses. So if you want to do that, if you want to do it, let's do it. If you don't want to do it, I'm not making you do it with me. I'm not making you do it with me. And in fact, I mean, if you, if you ain't in this for real, if you're not ready to endure, if you're not ready to get frustrated, if you're not ready to endure hardship and opposition, um, maybe it's not for you. But that's what we need to do. We must go lower and deeper to the real masses. And there is no alternative to doing that. That is what must be done. Lower and deeper to the real masses. Now, I don't see any super chats as of yet. No one seems to have any questions. Um, you know, um, I generally... Um, Generally, uh, the second half of the show is me uh, answering people's questions, but I don't I don't see any questions as of yet. I'm ready to answer any questions that people have. Um, but uh, as far as that, um, as far as that's concerned, um, you know, I did 
I've been meaning to play on these streams for quite some time. I've been meaning to play um, this song in honor of the striking workers uh, at the United Auto Workers um, at the UAW. I've been um, I've been meaning to put it on. Uh, this is from World War II. Um, this is from World War II. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, celebrating kind of how the uh, United Auto Workers was part of the war effort. Um, so I've, uh, I've thought since the United Auto Workers is on strike right now, since the like, majority of the public is on their side overwhelmingly, um, that it would be a good thing to play their song. I was hanging around a defense town one day, one day, when I thought I overheard a soldier say, soldier say, every tank in my camp has that UAW stamp, and I'm UAW too, I'm proud to say, it's that UAW CIO, makes that army roll and go, turning out the jeeps and tanks, the airplanes every day, it's that UAW CIO, makes that army roll and go, puts wheels on the USA. I was there when the Union came to town. Came to town. I was there when old Henry Ford went down. Ford went down. I was standing by gate four when I heard the people roar. They ain't gonna kick the auto workers around. It's that UAWCIO makes the army roll and go, turning out the jeeps and tanks and the airplanes every day. It's that UAWCIO makes the army roll and go, puts wheels on the USA. I was there on that cold December day, December day, when we heard about Pearl Harbor far away, far away. I was down in Cadillac Square when the Union rallied there to put those plans for pleasure cars away. It's that UAWCIO makes the army roll and go, turning out the jeeps and tanks, the airplanes every day. It's that UAWCIO makes that army roll and go, puts wheels on the USA. There'll be a Union label in Berlin. In Berlin, when the Union boys in uniform march in, march in, and rolling in the ranks, there'll be UAW tanks, roll Hitler out and roll the Union in. It's that UAWCIO makes the army roll and go, turning out the jeeps and tanks, the airplanes every day. It's that UAWCIO makes the army roll and go, the field on the We got a super chat from John. So you're first on the list, John, because I don't see any rumble rants. Uh, so yeah, you're going to be first on the list. Um, but, um, you know, um, I have, uh, the answer to that is yes. And I, I will put some of it on. We might as well just do that. Right. We might as well just put some of it on, um, you know, on the stream if we can, um, and, uh, and just react to it as it comes in. Um, and, uh, so, I also thought it might be good as we're waiting for more super chats to come in. And please, if you got something you want me to talk about in the second half of the show, send a super chat because I gotta I gotta have something to talk about in the second half of our program, right? Spent the first bit talking about going lower and deeper to the real masses and what our Portland campaign is about and why we need you to be part of it and why we're mobilizing and why we're reorienting the CPI to be a different kind of organization, not a social media brand. Um, but um I will, um, I do want to put on this other song because this, this song is called, this is from the cultural revolution in China. The song is, it's called sailing. The seas depends on the helmsman. That's the name of the song. Um, however, um, this, this video I'm about to show you, uh, is it, it was quite an incident in China because I believe this happened in 2015, 2014. Uh, they performed this song at the Great Hall of the People, which is one of the biggest government buildings uh, in China. And it was the first time it had been performed there since the Cultural Revolution. And it was Xi Jinping making a very clear political statement about the Communist Party and the communist origins of China. Um, and, uh, and, the, and the Communist Party and how he was reviving kind of the, the red culture and the Mao Zedong thought, et cetera. Um, and the version of the song that they performed at the Great Hall of the People uh, is very beautiful. Um, you know, there's many different ways to perform the song, um, you know, but uh, but this this version is particularly, uh, particularly beautiful. Um, so we're going to put it on 
we're going to put it on. Uh, this is the version that they uh, they performed at the. Um, oh my goodness! If the computer brings it up, we'll put it on. I'm just waiting for the computer to start cooperating. Ah, don't you love that? All right. But as soon as the computer cooperates and figures out that it's on the desktop, then I can upload it into the program and we'll be good to go. So yes, just as soon as, yeah, I don't know why it takes forever. I, 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 I move it onto the desktop and, and so we sit here and we kill time and I'm again, any other super chats? Um, oh, well, there you go. There's another super chat um, by somebody who just finished. Oh, it's from Sam, right? Sam. Thank you, Sam. Um, and Sam wrote a great review of the book on Amazon. Um, weird thing. So there's two reviews of the book up on Amazon now. There's another one that a friend of mine who read it wrote that has not gotten through yet. It's wild. It's weird. You know, Sam's review went up instantly. The one by the guy from, I don't know where he was. He has a name. It sounded kind of like he was from India. I have no idea who that was. That was that one went up. I mean, I don't know. Did it go up quick? Did it take a while? But then this other one from another friend of mine uh, hasn't gone through yet. So we're waiting for that one to go through. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so now we have a couple we have a couple uh, super chats. we got a couple. So I'm going to put on some music um, and then we'll probably do the roll call here pretty soon and then start answering super chats. But yeah, um, if you got any more super chats, uh, throw them my way. Give me something to talk about in the second half of our show. Yeah, that is a classic song of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was a, it. And that's a particularly lively uh, and musically uh, fun version of it that they performed in the Great Hall of the People. And that caused quite a bit of controversy, um, you know, because of the fact, um, you know, um, right there, because of the fact that uh, that it was definitely a revival of Mao's. Uh, red culture. So there we go. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the day uh, when we can take these streams only internally. Um, because I mean, as you can see, there's a lot of the, the internet is a cesspool. And that this isn't the best vehicle for recruitment, right? We should be recruiting real people who would never go looking for what we're about. We should recruit people who would never in a million years get on the internet and look for what communists or obscure communists have to say. We need to win average people. The kind of people who would go to the Asbury Revival because they're struggling and they're looking for an answer, that's who we need to be recruiting to the Center for Political Innovation. We need to change our political orientation, um, going lower and deeper to the real masses. That is what we need to do. That is what we need to do. Um, so, yeah, that's what we're doing. Um, now, I see there's, there's Super Chats here, and then there's a couple Rumble Rants. There's three Rumble Rants that have come in. So I guess we can um, we can probably at this point, um, you know, I, I guess at this point we can probably start, um, you know, uh, uh, we can do the roll call. 
So why don't I call you all out as I see you, names and locations, names and locations. Um, you know, um, you know, uh, names and locations. Oh, another Rumble rant. Uh, names and locations, names and locations. Um, who is with us tonight? Names and locations. So we got Mark Jones in Utica, New York. Welcome, Mark. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Names and locations. We got Victory Gin in New Mexico, Springfield in Massachusetts, Rice from Adelaide, Australia, Rupert Fellows in England. Um, Killian from Milwaukee. Shout out to Killian. David Rennie from Hamilton, Ontario. Alex from Brazil. AJ from New Jersey. Ottawa, Ontario. David Fox from Bendigo, Australia. Well-loved member of our community. Ian Chester from England. Randall Wilson from Lexington, Kentucky. St. David's Bermuda, Restless Native. Jamie and St. Paul. Welcome, Jamie. Yonatan Mahari in Stockholm, Sweden. Bob Troy in New York. Randall Wilson in Lexington, Kentucky. Chester, England. Ian Foster. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Names and locations, names and locations. Who is with us tonight? We got names and locations, names and locations. Who's with us? Who is with us? Names and location. Patch in Arizona. Welcome, Patch. So glad Mariah is in North Carolina. Great stream tonight. Well, thank you, Mariah. We really are glad that you're enjoying it. Temple City, California. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Names and locations. Names and locations. Who is with us tonight? Names and locations. Who is with us? All right. Someone, Roger from Western Nebraska. Welcome, Roger. Names and locations. Uh, on the Rumble, uh, we got Ryan in Kansas City. R Ryan Clark is on the Rumble. We got Chris in Texas is on the Rumble. Jamie in Idaho is on the Rumble. And Auckland, New Zealand is on the Rumble. Anoan is on the Rumble as well. And there's 30 people watching. Um, you know, uh, there's 30 people watching on uh, the Rumble. Um, you know, uh, uh, right now. So, you know, we're, you know, we're on different platforms. There's how many, there's two on the rock fin, there's 30 on the rumble. And then we got 116, uh, watching here on YouTube. So yeah, there you go. You know, like I said, Oh, we got Gabby in Chicago, Chris in Salt Lake city, seasoned noob in China, Steven Boston, Isabel from Canada, going to the people out of the internet. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Chris in Salt Lake City. Welcome, 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 everybody. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. Um, like I said, uh, if you want me to talk about something in the second half of our program here, um, why don't you uh, send a super chat or a rumble rant or a Rockfin tip? Give me something to talk about. Ellie in Chicago is on the Rockfin. Welcome, Ellie. She is on the Rockfin. Um, oh, and Lori Spencer is here. Uh, she's promoting the episode we just did where she interviewed me about the new book, Letter to Bob Avakian, um, which is, you know, it's available wherever books are sold and it's got good reviews so far. So uh, thank you, Lori. Lori is great, by the way. She does great stuff. She's heavily involved. She's following everything with RFK and his big upcoming announcement very closely. Um, it's really, really great. And um, it looks like on Sunday I will be streaming with Angela McCurdle, the national chairwoman of the Libertarian Party. Um, it looks like we'll be having a joint stream on Sunday. Um, until then, I am taking a social media cleanse. I am, I, the toxicity is getting to me. Um, and I am just, this has been a wild year, right? This, again, was the year of the epic comeback. We had our conference in, um, in, in, uh, in DC, we sponsored the Rage Against the War Machine. We had our amazing reception afterwards with Scott Ritter, and uh, you know we, you know we, we've we've done a lot this year. Uh, but but you know it's been a wild ride, and I guess it's starting to be fall, and the weather is changing, and I just I need a cleanse from social media because you know it 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 is a lot. I will say I am one hundred percent. I guess before I answer questions, I'll just throw this out there. I am one hundred percent with Max Blumenthal against Ben Norton. And there's been a number of people that have said to me, "Come on, Caleb, these are two anti-imperialist people. You don't know what happened." Bullshit. I know what happened. 
I know what happened, which is that they had a disagreement where Ben Norton refused. He lacked the intellectual courage to break with the synthetic left. Right. Um, you know, um, you know, that's what happened. Um, and Ben wouldn't break with the synthetic left. Um, and you know, Ben, he said, patriotic socialists are Nazis when the LaRouche people were doing a good job of disrupting, you know, then, then he went on a tirade against the LaRouche movement. Uh, Ben Norton is, is not a good dude. Okay. Um, when we were in Nicaragua, the center for political innovation delegation, we were on the same bus as Ben Norton for hours. He would not speak to any of us. He wouldn't even acknowledge us. He is a, and every time I've ever been in Ben Norton's presence, he does not let other people speak because he doesn't give a shit what other people have to say. He is the smartest man in the room and you are just, you are just there to listen to his greatness, right? Um, he doesn't blink, which is weird. He doesn't blink and he doesn't listen to other people. And Ben Norton is, I mean, he's a, a jerk. I mean, he has attacked this community as he calls us fascists. He calls us white supremacists. And, you know, and what happened was that, you know, he was working on gray zone with Max Blumenthal and they just had an irreconcilable disagreement. Um, you know, and so Ben then stole a bunch of money from the Patreon, a bunch of their social media accounts. And, and Max Blumenthal has published all of the, the evidence of this, that basically when it became clear that Ben Norton, who was at Gray Zone, couldn't continue with Gray Zone because he was scared to challenge the synthetic left because he wants to follow the mainstream left woke position. Um, in response to that, um, he stole a bunch of the assets of Gray Zone and change them to multipolarista. Um, and that Ben, you know, that that uh, for a long time, uh, you know, Max sat on it and tried to work behind the scenes through proxies to get it resolved. Um, and it made it was made clear that Ben Norton wouldn't do that. Um, and now and Ben Norton was in Nicaragua for a long time. I uh, was doing the expat thing in Nicaragua. And now he's left Nicaragua for Beijing. Um, and so Max decided to go forward with this. And he had a video where he confronted um, Ben Norton about it in Nicaragua. Um, and, you know, honestly, I'm not, you know, I'm one who says that social media fighting isn't good and all of that. But in this case, what else can Ben do? Right. I mean, you know, what else can Max Blumenthal do about Ben? Right. He's got to fight back somehow. Um, and that uh, that Ben, you know, Ben basically um, stabbed stabbed Max Blumenthal in the back, stole a bunch of the assets, stole, uh, basically it's calculated to about $70,000 worth of, of assets and property from gray zone. Um, and, uh, and over a petty political disagreement, um, you know, that's, uh, that's, you know, you got to fight back at some point. And I know legal action is being filed and I hope that Ben, uh, wins against Ben Norton in court. Uh, Ben Norton is not a good dude. Um, he's not a good dude. And, you know, he, in politically, his problem is that he is, there's no creative thought there. He does, he repeats whatever the woke left is saying, Republicans are racist, Trumpers are Nazis, blah, 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 blah. And he mixes RT, CGTN, and, you know, Telesur talking points in with it. That's all he does. Okay. Um, and he, he is so limited in his political understanding that when the Roe versus Wade decision came down, he was living in Nicaragua at the time and he was tweeting out attacking leftists like myself who said the abortion issue shouldn't be the focus, saying that anyone who doesn't want to fight against abortion is a theocrat fascist. And he's living in a socialist country that has one of the strictest anti-abortion laws in the world. Nicaragua's abortion restrictions are the strictest in the world. So he's calling the country that's hosting him, that's basically hosting him where he's getting paid to make anti-imperialist propaganda. He's accusing that country of being a theocratic fascist country. I mean, that was just classic. That was just classic. Um, and there were multiple times that CPI members were in Nicaragua and they would arrange for him to come to a dinner, you know, a reception, and then he wouldn't show up. 
I mean, he's he's a jerk. He's a jerk. I mean, in just so many different ways. But on top of that, he just straight up stole money from Max Blumenthal, um, you know, and and he is he is about keeping left keeping anti-imperialist politics and socialism in a box, preventing people from going lower and deeper to the real masses. Right. He is there to make sure that he's there to more or less lobby socialist countries to support the Democrats. That's basically what he's there to do. Right. Is to say to the socialist countries, look, I'm a woke leftist. I'm a woke leftist who supports the Democrats and thinks Republicans are fascists. And I repeat your talking points. So therefore, you should support the Democrats. Right. And it's the Democrats have been running that game for years. That's what the Communist Party degenerated into over the course of the Cold War. Gus Hall, his, his you know, shining moment was when Walter Mondale called him on the phone during the 1984 presidential election. He thought that was like the most amazing, most successful moment of his, his life. And that that's kind of what the, the communist uh, groups, a lot of them deteriorated into, into in the eighties in the seventies and eighties, you know, and that's what the party of socialism and liberation and some of the labor bureaucracy are doing now. And that's what Ben Norton is doing. Um, and um, so politically I'm opposed to him. And on top of that, you know, I, there's all kinds of people I disagree with. All you know that I talk to, interact with, but he couldn't even be courteous enough to introduce himself, shake hands when we were in Nicaragua. Uh, after we'd already met, before things got crazy, when you know, I think bef- you know, we met at a reception where I met AOC and stuff, when we were still kind of on the same team politically, uh, you know, we you know, we'd met, so he knew who I was, um, you know, but he, he didn't even have the kindness, he couldn't even shake hands or be polite to any of the other CPI members that were with us in Nicaragua. I mean, he's just a jerk and any conversation he ever has, he never lets the other person finish a sentence. Um, he doesn't blink, which is weird. Right. And maybe he's on the spectrum, you know, maybe, maybe he's got some kind of autism or something like that, which, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, um, you know, it's frustrating because, you know, there are some people who work really, really hard, you know, if it doesn't come naturally to them to, to be polite to other people, if it doesn't come naturally to, you know, if they, they just say the wrong thing in social settings without saying it. Some people work really, really hard to not act that way. Ben doesn't. Why does he need to do that? Right. He's got a hundred gajillion million followers on Twitter. He can just be a jackass. And, you know, and, you know, and part of autism also is that autistic people tend to have really a real smart side to them as well. You know, they tend to actually be, you know, maybe they don't have the social skills to get along with people, but they also are really in depth and really understand their politics. That's not Ben. I mean, any PSL member can basically tell you everything Ben knows. You know, U.S. imperialism bad, coup happened here, you know, Republican equals Nazi, Trumper equals Nazi, you know, patriotic socialism, fascist. I mean, I mean, it's just kind of, you know, you know, uh, you know, so I don't I don't see the upside. I don't see like the splinter skill. You know, maybe he's maybe he, he does have some kind of neurological disorder and that's why he acts like a jerk. But I don't see the the upside. I don't see the intelligence. Name one breakthrough that Ben Norton has ever had politically. Name one tactical turnaround that he's ever done. You know, what has he done? He's attacked the Rage Against the War Machine rally. Oh, that that was a great breakthrough, right? He attacked the Rage Against the War Machine rally. What else has he done? Uh, ben Norton has uh, attacked attacked the LaRouche movement when they were doing all the amazing disruptions. Like name one contribution Ben Norton has ever made to the class struggle in America. I can't think of one. In fact, all I can think of is Ben Norton attacking people for making contributions, right? Black Lives Matter was doing their thing. He said, yay, I support it. He tailed after it, right? Uh, you know, Bernie Sanders was doing his thing. He said, yay, I support it and tailed after it, right? Um, you know, but I mean, name one contribution that has ever been made by Ben Norton, right? After Dari Dugana was murdered, he celebrated the death of Dari Dugana. Uh, he said he would spit on her grave. Um, and, uh, he went on a whole tirade against Alexander Dugan just to show everybody that, no, don't worry. I support, I I'm in agreement with the Ukrainian murderers, uh, who murdered this young woman. I met Dari Dugan a number of times when I was in Russia. Um, and I mean, it, it was heartbreaking to me to hear what happened to her. She was an amazing person and she did not deserve to die. Um, you know, uh, and, uh, so, you know, I just, I mean, as much as I hate social media drama and I will admit this is part of the toxicity, this is why I'm. 
this is why I'm stepping away from social media. As I made my point, I supported Max Blumenthal against Ben Norton 100%, but I need to just take a couple days here to, you know, Friday, Saturday, and most of Sunday, I'll probably not be online. I'm going to delete Twitter from my phone, um, you know, shut down social media on my phone. Uh, and then I will, um, I will probably get back on, uh, you know, on Sunday, but I just need a cleanse because it's just been a lot, it's been a bit much, you know, and you know, there are some people that I thought were my friends. We had a little disagreement and then they blocked me and that was very hurtful to me. And I, I'm, you know, I, that was not necessary. Um, and, uh, you know, it just seems like social media is just a giant atomization factory, break apart relationships, break apart friendships, break apart political alliances, everyone's differences, you know, and really the only way out of this, we got to have our own app, right? We got to have our own app, right? We need to have our own app. Uh, and I mean, we don't have the resources to make it. I don't know anybody who can make apps, but ultimately, you know, what we need to do is we need to develop an app for our community. And that app has to be designed by us to do the opposite of what regular social media does, right? We got to design a social media app that makes people smarter, not dumber, that encourages people to get along, rewards people for getting along, not rewarding people for fighting. Um, you know, that, that promotes our politics rather than the politics of our political opponents. We got to make our own app, you know, we'll make our own app. Um, you know, and, um, it's kind of like, you know, it's that whole thing of like, people say, well, that sounds totalitarian, Caleb, you want to make an app and control what people think. No, there's already an app that controls what people think it's called Facebook. There's already an app that controls what people think it's called Twitter. The question is, you know, if you use a phone. And if you are getting information, there's going to be someone controlling how you think, who do you want it to be? Do you want it to be revolutionaries who are aligned with you and share your political view and are against the system? Or do you want it to be Mark Zuckerberg and the Pentagon, right? Well, for those who choose to align with our politics and our political view, we'll have our own app. Um, and I think that's what we need. Um, you know, and, um, you know, I, I hope that as we go lower and deeper to the real masses, part of that will be recruiting people to get on our app and get off of the mainstream apps. We need our own app as we build a movement, as we go lower and deeper to the real masses, as we recruit people who would not be recruited. Um, we need to have our own app. So if anyone's watching right now and could help us with that, I mean, I, I have no idea uh, if you know how we could make our own app our own Twitter, our own Facebook, our own app, um, you know, to, through which we can work with people. Um, you know, that would be great. And our app, not only would it push, you know, our own politics, but it would also make our audience better. Good art makes the audience better. Our app would encourage people to exercise. Our app would encourage people to, um, you know, to eat healthy. Our app would encourage people to be optimistic. We need to make our own app right? That is our alternative to regular social media. So, you know, if people plug in, you know, people are going to be plugged in. You can't, you can't roll back the wheels of history, right? You can't be like, well, cars have been invented. I don't like them. I'm going with horse and buggies. Doesn't work that way, right? Especially in, you know, the age of political warfare, you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. We just need our own app. Um, I did, and I'd already seen it and, you know, I'll, I did, I did. And I, I, we might put that on John Why, might as well. But anyway, so, so now I will start answering people's super chat questions. Um, uh, but yeah, um, we're going to put on, we got the rumble rants. So, all right. The rumble rants. Uh, oh, wow. There's a lot of these rumble rants. Okay. First one, political defending of the Nazis in world war II with fighting against the USSR didn't necessarily make you a Nazi fascist tendency on the rise in Canada. Well, look, there, um, there was a, um, you know, you know, uh, there was a, um, there was a, uh, book published by Timothy Snyder called Bloodlands. And that book is basically trying to give the impression, uh, that pro-fascist Nazi fighters during World War II uh, who are funded by the Nazis or aligned with the Nazis to fight the Russians, that there's like some case to be made for them. That's what Timothy Snyder is saying. 
If you don't, you know, Timothy Snyder wrote a whole book trying to basically argue that point. Well, the, the communists were just so bad. The communists and the Russians killed so many people that, uh, you know, the, the, these various nationalist groups, the, the Chechens, the, the Ukrainians that aligned with the Nazis, um, that they are um, somehow justified. Grover Fur ripped that book to shreds. That book is full of lies, just complete and utter lies utter lies, deceptions, falsehoods. That book contains inaccurate information, um, you know, but that is a common argument, right? Um, you know, and that, you know, this, this is not new. And especially in the West, there's long been this effort to say, well, being a fascist is an understandable mistake because communism is just so bad. That's a really common argument. So it's, you know, the, it's not the first time we've heard that argument from anti-communists, right? That argument has been made Many, many times, right? Um, it's a very common argument. Ludwig von Mises made that argument. Friedrich von Hayek, the Austrian school, made that argument. They were against fascism because it involved state control of the economy, but they liked it. You know, it was better than communism. That's a really common argument among right wingers, anti communists. I've been making those arguments for years, um, honestly. All right. You're right about the, and this is Mariah, you're right about the 2024 election being a mess now that Cornell has left the greens to run Indy. So there are two write in candidates, RFK and Cornell doesn't make sense. The greens had ballot access. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, the take of, uh, Nick Brana was that this was basically Cornell West dropping out of the race. Um, you know, that, that, uh, cause if he was a green party candidate, he would actually be on the ballot. Um, but it was just, you know, he, he, the pressure got to him. And so this is a way he can drop out without dropping out, right? People can still write his name in, but he's not really going to be on the ballot. So he, he surrendered to the Democrats. And I think Nick Brown is absolutely right about that. I think he's absolutely right that that's what this is. Cornell West threw in the towel. Um, you know, um, that's, that's what I would, I would argue. Um, Cornell West, uh, threw in the towel. So, um, you know, uh, so there you go. Um, I don't know what more to say about it. Uh, Cornell West dumped the Green Party abruptly, ran independent, came back fighting, came, hope he came back fighting for the People's Party. No, he won't. He won't. In West Virginia, I'm from West Virginia originally. How do you economically save a place like that? Well, uh, first thing, first thing first would be public ownership of all those natural resources, right? All the, the mines that are there ought to be public property, right? The natural resources that get extracted from that region should be public property. Same for the natural gas that's there. Um, on top of that, um, you know, infrastructure, right? Start paving those roads, start, you know, building new hospitals and schools, you know, uh, infrastructure would be important. Um, you know, I think our four point plan at the Center for Political Innovation, which you can find on our website, cpiusa.org. It's just four points. I think that would lead to a revitalization of West Virginia and, and most of the country, but West Virginia in particular. I grew up with a lot of kids from West Virginia. I grew up in Ohio, but there were many kids in my small town who were from West Virginia and had moved up to, uh, up to the part of Ohio I grew up in in the 90s. Uh, because things were getting worse, economically speaking, in West Virginia during those years. But, you know, that's one thing people, you know, people gloss over is that, you know, people have it in their heads that, um, well, in, you know, in, in the 1950s, everybody was doing well. There's always been a, a white underclass, right? A, among, you know, yes, you have a black underclass, you have a Chicano underclass, you have poverty among dark, darker folks, and you have that. Uh, and that absolutely is a reality, but you also have always had, there has always been a white underclass. There's always been white workers that are in prison, white workers who live in trailer parks, white, you know, the Appalachian communities, um, you know, you go to Oklahoma, there's a lot of very poor white people in Oklahoma. Um, you know, and one of my frustrations with the synthetic left is that they don't think that poor white people exist. Um, you know, and that's a really, really common frustration. And I've talked about that on this streams before that, you know, I remember when I was becoming a communist activist, um, there was a, a website that was sent around. It was like a joke and it was called stuff white people like, um, and I looked at this website and I read it and I thought like, well, I'm from a small town that's almost entirely white. No one in my town likes any of this stuff. And it was this list of stuff white people like, and it was like black political prisoners, coffee shops, 
you know, using, I mean, it was all kinds of stuff that, I mean, I'm sorry, the white people I grew up around didn't like any of this stuff. Um, you know, um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 they're, you know, the white working class is something that a lot of these people, um, a lot of the, the, you know, and Joe Biden himself, I, I'll never forget that speech where he said, you know, poor kids are just as smart as white kids. Remember that? That was one of Joe Biden's classic, uh, flubs. Poor kids are just as smart as white kids, right? As if, as if, you know, all black and brown kids must be poor and all white kids, you know, wouldn't be poor. I mean, it was, that was a classic Joe Biden moment. So there you go. Um, you know, there you go. Um, but, um, all righty. So, okay. My ancestors came to the USA running from Stalin's pogroms, but you seem to think he was a great leader. I understand the czars did the same things to the Jews, but they seem to be bad to me. Well, Lori, I don't know what, can you tell me what these Stalin pogroms were? Because my understanding is that in the Soviet Union, anti-Semitism was illegal, uh, that they actually, you know, would execute people for making anti-Semitic comments that Stalin, you know, for a while they were printing people's last names. If a Jewish person had changed their last name, they would put like in parenthesis, their actual Jewish last name. Stalin put an end to that practice. Um, you know, some people say the doctor's plot was anti-Semitic, right? That, you know, these doctors who had allegedly been, you know, been going against Stalin, that somehow that was an anti-Semitic thing. But what are these anti-Semitic pogroms? Do you know what a pogrom is, Lori? A pogrom is when, you know, the economy is doing bad in a medieval feudal society. Uh, the, the king mobilizes all the peasants to go burn the homes of the Jewish people, go to the Jewish neighborhood, the ghetto, right? Where Jews are forced to live separate from everybody else and go and burn the whole place. When did Stalin do that? When, I mean, I mean, you know, Lori, you're telling me that there were, Lori Lamb is telling me that there are, there were pogroms in the Soviet Union. I want to know what evidence do you have that Stalin ever staged a literal pogrom that he, he, the economy was doing bad. So Stalin called up all the people and sent them to the ghetto to burn the homes of the Jews. When did that happen? Lori, I, I mean, I mean, can you show me any evidence of that happening historically? Um, you know, I, I, um, I, I mean, Lori, I, I hear this and I hear this from Zionists all the time. Well, there were pogroms in the Soviet Union. Can you show me any evidence? Um, can you show me any evidence of these pogroms ever happening in the Soviet Union? I, I, I've never heard of this, right? Uh, there was a Jewish autonomous region that was created in the Soviet Union. Uh, people argue that there was anti-Semitism beneath the surface. The USA put uh, sanctions on the USSR in the 80s because of they said that the Jews, they weren't being allowed to circumcise their kids. Circumcision was considered to be child abuse, uh, things like that. Um, but pogroms, I mean, you're talking about burning Jewish villages. like. When did Stalin do that? Uh, actually, the Red Army, the Bolsheviks protected the Jewish villages. That's why, like Sam Marcy, the founder of the Workers' World Party, that's why he was a loyal communist his whole life is because his Jew his Jewish village was protected, uh, was protected by the Red Army. And, um, you know, I mean, the Bolshevik Party leadership had a lot of Jewish folks in it. I, I'm just, wh when were these pogroms in the Soviet Union, Lori? Like, can you, can you provide evidence of them? I had an uncle who was killed in a pogrom run by Stalin. Okay, well, when did this pogrom happen? When, I mean, and how did this happen? Because they didn't have segregated Jewish villages in the Soviet Union, right, Lori? Right. So, so you're saying that that I mean, when did this pogrom happen? When Stalin went to the public and said, "All right, we're going to go get them Jews." Did that 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 does that didn't happen, Lori? Lori, I mean, there is no such event that you were describing. Was there anti-Semitism in the USSR? Absolutely. Was there, did they create the Jewish autonomous region to give a national territory to Jews in the Soviet Union? Yes. Um, you know, were there times where people were being baited over their ancestry in unfair ways? Absolutely. But, but you're telling me there was a pogrom, a literal pogrom. Tell me where, where it, it was in the 1920s. Uh, okay, well, Stalin wasn't even in power. Really, he didn't solidify his leadership of the Bolshevik Party until 1927. But when did this happen in the 1920s? When were there pogroms in the 1920s? Lori, I, I, I think you got your facts wrong there. OK, you just got your facts wrong. There were not pogroms in the Soviet Union. Right. There, there just weren't, uh, you know, there were there were times people were arrested on suspicion of spying. 
Uh, you know, there were there were alleged Israeli spies that were arrested and people claimed that was anti-Semitic. But pogroms, you're talking about burning villages, right? That just didn't happen. Right. I mean, I, you know, I'm just not I'm not finding I'm not seeing any evidence of that. If you can provide me with evidence, I'm open to the possibility. I don't want to play the the historical denial game. And I know that a lot of atrocities were committed in Soviet history. Plenty of innocent people went to gulags who didn't belong there. You know, there was you know, I mean, these things happen, but. I, I'm just I, I'd like to see the evidence of this pogrom, you know, I, I, I just, you know, and I, I just I. You know, there you go. All right. So I got a couple more super chats here or rumble rants. Uh, Anoan says 30 silver coins was probably $70,000 back in Jesus time. He's making a comparison of Ben Norton to Judas Iscariot. There you go. I can't argue with that. Since so someone said, can you explain Deng Xiaoping theory? Sure. Uh, Deng Xiaoping theory uh, was the understanding that China needed to raise its population out of poverty and that in order to do it, they needed foreign investment, that you cannot have a higher stage in poverty, that that was the mistake of the Cultural Revolution, the idea that you can have communism in poverty. You cannot build an egalitarian society in poverty. The basis of equality and egalitarianism is abundance. And so socialism, a planned economy, is the road to that. Um, but if a country is deeply impoverished and has, you know, has no economy to speak of, it can't just redistribute the poverty that's already there. It needs foreign investment. Um, and so by creating market zones and by, by emboldening the layer of socialist countries, the intellectuals, the engineers, the scientists, the people that often felt stifled in socialist societies by enabling them, they were able to make China's economy strong. And Deng Xiaoping theory was they, you know, it's, I think it's been put into practice in Vietnam and mo modern Cuba, North Korea is moving in that direction. And that is the future. And if you read Deng Xiaoping's writings, they make it very clear that it's communist and it is absolutely rooted in Marxism Leninism. But the understanding is that the only way that we can raise our country out of poverty is we need there to be initiative. We need people to start their own businesses. We need people to do all that, but it needs to be controlled and it needs to fit in with the overall vision for building an egalitarian society. And it's understanding what Marx said in the critique of the Goetha program, which is that the narrow horizon of bourgeois right can only be crossed when society reaches a state of abundance and that the basis of building full communism is vast material abundance, right? That the basis of social hierarchies, the state oppression is poverty, right? When there's not enough to go around, some will have and some will have not, right? But when there's enough for everybody, inequality breaks down, right? And that, that this is something. But the problem with capitalism is that capitalism is a system where abundance creates poverty. And you have poverty amid plenty, the problem of overproduction. I'm sure this will come up in my chat with Angela McCurdle on Sunday. Uh, it'll probably come up at great length. So um, there you go. But yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, Patrick, for that one. And now we're going to start, you know, doing I'll keep looking for rumble rants because there seem to be a lot of them tonight. And that's good. But I'm going to start doing the super chats. Have you had a chance to read any of Putin's Valdi speech? Well, I've seen some of the clips that were on RT. I haven't had a chance to read the entire thing. I don't think, do you have a full transcript? I don't think I have a full transcript, but I, I watched some of it on RT today. Um, and actually, I'm gonna, um, I might as well just, we'll put a couple of clips on, right, from the Valdi speech. Why not? Right, let's put them on. Um, because I think it was a, it was important. You know, Putin is a really, really key world leader and you know why not so yeah i'll i'll put on some of the valdi speech i've actually been to the valdi discussion club in 2017 i went to the valdi discussion club and i i watched putin speak at the valdi discussion club along with jack ma along with ahmed ahmed chalabi so you know i've seen what it's like at valdi discussion club it's kind of neat it's up in the mountains it's near sochi russia but it's up in the mountains you know um it's the mountains near Sochi, Russia. And uh, so, yeah, why don't we put some of the speech on, right? Just give people a chance to to hear it, right? Um, so, so there we go. Let me just, uh, um, I'm just going to 
pull up a couple clips from the Valdi speech. Might as well watch it, right? Let Putin speak for himself. I don't want to get it wrong. So, all right. I'm talking about Nord Stream 2. Um, you know, um, talking about the goals of the cooperation between Russia and, you know, talking about Armenia. Oh, here, Putin on civilizations. Let's put that on. All right. All right. We got a clip we're going to put on here for you. So let me just download, download the clip. We'll, th we'll put on a couple clips or at least one clip. We'll watch this clip from the Valdi speech because it's important. So, all righty. Do, 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 do. All right. Okay. Putin, Valdi. All right. We'll put it on. All right. All right, we'll put we'll put we'll put a, a clip of Vladimir Putin from the Valdi Discussion Club on so that we can enjoy it for our entertainment. All right, Putin at Valdi at Valdi. Okay. Oh, here it is. Okay, very good. All right, here we go. This to be an openly colonial interpretation of a so-called civilized world, which serves as an example for everyone else, and everyone should follow these standards, these examples. And if you don't agree, you will be beaten into civilization by the enlightened masters. But these times as I said, are long gone. And our understanding of civilization is absolutely different. First of all, there are numerous civilizations, and no civilization can be better or worse than others. They are equal in their rights, expressing the desires of their cultures and traditions of their people. And everyone has their own values. For me, these means the wishes and interests of my own people, and I am happy to be a part of it. Wow. Wow. Well, that's bold, isn't it? Right? We need to get, get past this idea, this Western notion that there are there are civilized people and uncivilized people, and that the West will, you know, beat the world into its own civiliza civilization. Uh, that's that's quite bold. Um, you know, what if folks think about that? That was pretty powerful, right? He's calling out uh, the Western chauvinist way of doing things, this assumption that the West is the best um, and the Western way of doing things is the way things should be done. He's saying that every civilization is equal and has a right to be its own way. Um, yeah, that was that was pretty bold. Honestly, that was a pretty bold, uh, bold statement. I'll, I'll put on another I'll put on another clip. Um, people say that is right. Yeah, I see a lot of Z's in the chat. Um, so yeah. Um, oh, here's the full transcript. John posted the full transcript. We'll put on another clip from today at Baldi at Baldi discussion club. I've actually been there. Um, and it was quite an honor, but you know, Putin, Putin knows how to just let break it down, you know? So why don't we put on another clip? All right. Okay. Um, this is, um, yeah. As soon as this other clip is ready. Um, yeah. We'll just be waiting for it to show up here, show up on the desktop, and then I can load it in. Um, but yeah. Oh, here it is. Okay, here's the other one. It's time to get rid of this colonial thinking. It's time to open your eyes. That era is long gone, it's never coming back. Let me tell you more, throughout centuries, Such actions and such behavior resulted in the repetition of large-scale wars. Various ideological 
or even pseudo-moral justifications were made up to justify such wars. This is especially dangerous today. Humanity has the means capable of easily destroying the entire planet. There is a great manipulation of the minds, which leads to the loss of sense of reality. It's time to leave this vicious circle. We should find a way out. Wow. Yeah, he's saying it's time to reject the colonial mindset. Um, that's amazing. Wow. Wow. That's great. That's great. All right. Now, Sam Bismuth is saying he just finished my book on Bob Avakian right here. Letter to Bob Avakian. Can you explain why he was so successful? Well, you know, Sam, in the book, I make the point that he's not like in terms of like, he's not like a wildly successful political leader, but the reason that his group still exists and all the others haven't, and the reason that he was able to effectively pull off some very big mobilizations, uh, like May Day 1980, like the, um, you know, the very important rally, we've carried the rich for 200 years, now let's dump them off our backs during the bicentennial, is because he had a level of passion and charisma uh, about him that he was able to kind of get the membership worked up and he was able to, you know, to really kind of, he had a passion that transmitted to the people. And I, I talk about that in like section two of this book, I talk about that and that, um, that it, it took me a long time to understand that. But if you read the history of the RCP, they are able to create an atmosphere where like the time is now go, go, go. It's time to get things done. And that is one of the strengths of the RCP. Um, and that when, when you are mobilizing and trying to accomplish your goal, uh, other people are attracted simply to that energy, um, you know, and there's a kind of a Sorellianism about it, right? Uh, an action obsession. And the, the Revolutionary Communist Party, when they are in their full mobilization mode, when they were building for their, I remember when I was in college, when they were building their drive out the Bush regime rallies. But years ago, if you read about May Day 1980, and if you read about, uh, you know, about some of the stuff they did, no business as usual during the, the 80s to protest against nuclear war, they could really create an atmosphere where people really gave all of their strength and energy to really mobilize to get things done. And that is an admirable attribute. And in, if you're going to do politics in the United States that are not mainstream, uh, that attribute is actually almost necessary because... Um, you know, you, you need to be able to create enough momentum that you can, you can have an impact when, when you may not have the mass, right? It's kind of an analogy I would use. It's like, you know, um, you know, what's the analogy? What's the thing that they always say that if, you know, you drop a penny off the empire state building, it'll hit somebody in the head and kill them. And technically that's not true. Right. But everybody knows the reason people think that's true is because, you know, a penny isn't very big. But it's all that momentum it gains from being dropped from all the way down from the Empire State Building, right? That uh, That is what gives it strength. And if you're a political group in the United States that is fringe, and this is very true, if you're a political group that, that has an ideology that is obscure, one way you can amplify your strength is with momentum. And that's one thing about the Revolutionary Communist Party is that they make up for their lack of size and in, and influence by having a huge momentum, right? And they are able to get their membership in, in a go, go, go mode to really get things done. Um, and that, that has a lot to do with Bob. And also all the Maoist communist groups from that period pretty much have collapsed. Uh, you know, the October League, uh, the Communist Workers Party, the Communist Labor Party, but Bob and the RCP, they stayed intact. Uh, because of that charisma that Bob had and that to some degree or other, uh, the RCP was able to learn something from socialist states. They were able to learn from the effectiveness of the cult of personality, um, you know, that, that, you know, that was Stalin, right? Stalin was the leader at the top who got the whole Soviet Union into a building mode with the five-year plans. We we're going to go build this country. We're going to industrialize. Fidel Castro was like that, right? We're going to, you're going to, we're going to, build Cuba up. We're going to have a huge sugar output, you know, and that by creating uh, an atmosphere of construction and mobilization and, and, and getting people to just give their all, 
right? Um, that that is kind of the strength of an effective cult of personality. And that's why, you know, the, the Stalin uh, thing, the, the Stalin cult of personality that developed, and then later with Mao, Fidel Castro, Kim Il-sung, that's kind of the role that it played. It had a spiritual quality to it of kind of mobilizing people to carry out goals effectively. Um, and I think a lot of communist groups tried to pull that off and failed, but the RCP to whatever degree was successful at pulling that off. So I get into that in the book, but then I argue that that's not a totally material thing, that there is a spiritual aspect to that. And even though our, our Bob is an atheist and he denies that he claims to be a pure materialist, that ability to mobilize people, to get people worked up into a frenzy of passion, to, to really build huge protests and, and get themselves arrested. And, you know, what Bob has done throughout his life and kind of creating a frenzy from the time of 1969, where he got communists from all over the country to go join the Richmond oil workers strike, that there is a, a level of charisma there that has a spiritual quality to it. And uh, he denies that. He may, says, well, no, 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 I'm just a pure materialist. And I would argue that that, and then that leads to his ideology becoming very confused because, you know, if you deny that there's anything spiritual, the spiritual side of humanity, we all are very emotional. We all have a spiritual side to us. The spiritual side of you will assert itself somehow, even if you deny it. All right. Hope that answers your question, Sam. And, and Sam wrote a great review of my book. Um, and if you liked my book, go write a review of it for Amazon. A couple of them are up there already. Um, and, uh, you know, go read it. Tell me what you think. All right. Thoughts on Smedley Butler. Smedley Butler was a U.S. Marine Corps general who revealed the business plot, the fascist plot to overthrow Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and he revealed it. And he was a U.S. Marine Corps general. Um, and he exposed that there were a number of wealthy capitalists who were plotting to violently overthrow Roosevelt in order to set up a fascist state. Um you know, uh, and he later then he wrote the book War is a Racket, um, exposing uh, the military industrial complex and and how profiteering from war is just a reality and how the the operations that he was sent on throughout his life, the, the military places he was sent. He was fighting for corporations to make profits and he became a Quaker and a pacifist. Uh, Smedley Butler certainly made a contribution. He's a, an anti-war hero in American history. Uh, who, you know, is it somebody who was a top general who became an anti-war voice. Uh, I, I admire Smedley Butler a lot. I did get the Tulsi Gabbard clip that you sent. Um, you know, um, you know, I, I believe I, I had seen it before because it was posted on her YouTube channel, but you know, we can watch it on here. I like Tulsi Gabbard. Anything Tulsi Gabbard does, I tend to like, and it's on her YouTube channel. So why don't we, why don't we watch, um, Tulsi Gabbard. This is her kind of describing how they went after her presidential campaign. I will say the audio quality, I, I, this is like a talk she gave somewhere. I don't know where. And the audio quality uh, of the, the, the video is not very good. Whoever was doing the audio uh, of her talk, they, they should have gotten a better microphone. But regardless, the message is great. Tulsi Gabbard is utterly amazing in many, many ways. So we're going to put this clip on. Uh, this is Tulsi. It's a longer clip, so I'll I'll stop and comment on it, but we'll react to it. And thank you, John, for the suggestion. Um, yeah, we'll put Tulsi Gabbard on. Why not, right? Why not? Um, okay. Do, do, do. Now we, we do that thing where I put it on the desktop and then we wait forever for it to actually show up on the desktop. Yeah, we'll put Tulsi's uh, clip on uh, because it's a good one. Uh, it's a pretty good one. Tulsi, uh, it, there's something special there, right? You know, she's not a communist. She is not a communist by any means. Right. And I told you her background with the, you know, the Hare Krishna breakaway. Um, but she represents a very good force in American politics right now. And I, I also believe that she pays attention to what we do. Right. I think she's read somebody on her staff has probably read my book on Kamala Harris um, because she's featured prominently in it. Um, you know, I know for a fact, some of, I know some of the people who did debate prep with her, um, you know, uh, you know, I know some of them and I, I work, I can't say more than that, but there's people I have worked with in the past that have, have been very key volunteers for Tulsi. And, you know, we're, I, I've only met her once in my life at a reception in New York city, uh, by some Pakistani Americans. Uh, but that said, I, I think she is in our network. I think she's listening to what we say. And she's being careful about it, right? And then you saw the clip. Um, you saw the clip. Uh, you know, do I have it here? Uh, you, you've seen the le legendary clip uh, from when uh, 
you know, uh, from when, um, what's his name? Uh, the, what is his name? Uh, Trevor Loudon said that she's influenced by me. Right. And so I think he's, uh, he says that probably on good intelligence. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, um, th this clip, I did not fake this. This is an actual writer for the Epoch Times interviewed on the Roger Stone podcast. One of the biggest pro Trump podcasts said this. Really there to promote Russian and North Korean foreign policies. She may not understand that, but she's being used by people like Dennis Kucinich and others to do that. She also has some connections to the Center for Political Innovation, which is a very pro-Russian outfit um, run by a man called Caleb Malpin, who used to be in the Workers' World Party. She's on the... So there you go. I mean, I... Trevor gets many things wrong in his columns, but that is something that I suspect he's right about. I think that she probably does pay attention to the work that we do. Um, so yeah, there you go. All right. So now we'll, we'll play this, this recent Tulsi clip. Um, it's a longer clip, so we'll probably stop and talk about it as we go. Um, if anyone has any more super chats or rumble rants or whatnot, um, by all means, go ahead. About ruining and destroying people who get in their way. I have a little bit of experience with this. I've served in Congress for eight years. When I first got there, I, was, I got a lot of attention that I didn't expect at all. I was invited to a lot of the fancy parties in DC, which is like the status symbol, right? Like, oh, who's, who, did you go to this ambassador's party or the White House correspondence dinner and all this stuff? It's a lot like high school. True story, true story. You look on the House floor, you ever in Washington, go sit in the gallery and you look at what groups are huddled together on the House floor. Yeah, and that is infuriating to me, right? You know, we want our country to be governed by people who take politics seriously, you know, not people that are, you know, doing a high school clique thing and are worried about how popular they are and all of that. It's really unfortunate. Tells you a lot. Once they learned... Who was it? I think it was John. Somebody asked me, how, how in the world did they pick you to be vice chair of the Democratic National Committee? Well, they didn't know me, first of all. <laughs> I'm not joking. It was, it was a couple of weeks in, after I had been first sworn into office in 2013 when I got a call saying, would you like to be vice chair of the DNC? And my literal response was, what is a vice chair of the DNC and what, like, what do you really want me to do? What are you asking of me? They didn't know. <laughs> they didn't know. It's a meaningless title. It's a meaningless title. And there's a lot of that that goes on. Meaningless titles that are given out to people. And uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, one thing I will say is uh, never be impressed with a title. Never be impressed with a title. Uh, be impressed with an accomplishment that someone carries out. Do not be impressed with a title because often a, a title can be meaningless. I just got aloha for everybody, you know? They didn't know. They didn't realize that I wasn't going to be a puppet. They didn't realize that by dangling these things that a lot of people like really, really, really desire and hold on to for dear life, like it didn't matter to me. That I wasn't going to fall for the trinkets that they, that they offered because I knew where my priorities stood. My commitment was not to the Democratic Party or any party for that matter. My commitment was to our country. My commitment was to my brothers and sisters who never came home. And so once they realized that Again, I'm not exaggerating. I would walk down the street and people would cross the street to walk on the other side. Because they didn't even have the courage to walk by me and say, Hi, Tulsi, how are you? They began their attacks on my presidential campaign the moment I walked up on that stage to announce my candidacy. Locked and loaded, they were ready to go. And in their minds, it was game on. So the tactics that they used against me are the same ones they're using against Donald Trump. They're the same ones that they're using against uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. 
telling voters in New Hampshire and Iowa, oh, yeah, you don't, your votes don't matter. They won't be counted. Don't even bother. And so what we're seeing here, that this isn't something personal about me or Donald Trump or Bobby Kennedy or other candidates who have faced this kind of wrath. This is about you. This is about the voters in this country. This is about them telling all of us that this facade of a democracy that they have painted doesn't actually exist because they don't care about our voices. They don't care about the Constitution. We also see how this same attitude of bend the knee or else is implemented in their foreign policy. How we see this attitude saying, well, all other countries in the world must bend to the wishes of the United States or else you will be an adversary or an enemy. This attitude and mindset goes against the, the very vision for our country's foreign policy that our founders had for us. They don't care about the consequences of their actions. Thomas Jefferson rightly talked about these cowardly leaders when he said they prefer the calm of despotism to the boisterous sea of liberty. This is the world they want this country to be. So instead of a government ordained to secure these rights, they are intent on taking them away. But the good news is it does not have to be this way. Harry Truman once said, and I came across this quote recently and I loved it. He said, America was not built on fear. America was built on courage, imagination, and an unbeatable determination to do the job at hand. Well, that job is at hand, folks. We have been given a no-fail mission by our founding fathers. Not just me or Bob or John or other individuals. They were talking to every one of us when they said, we the people. They were talking to us when they spoke of a self-governed nation. We, the people, we have the power, but it only works if we use it. It doesn't mean we are going to agree on every issue or that we should somehow walk in lockstep. Our founding fathers didn't agree on every issue. We see how fiercely they debated and fought with each other, sometimes physically, which I don't condone. But debate is good. Bringing different ideas, different experiences, different backgrounds to this conversation about how we save our country and how we solve these problems, it makes us stronger. The one thing, the thing that our founding fathers coalesced around, stood together on, is the same thing that we need to stand together on today. Who we are as Americans this foundation upon which our country was built, our love for this country, and our commitment to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Yeah, that was great. That was absolutely great. Um, and if anyone has any more, you know, more Super Chats, Rumble Rants, you know, Rockfin tips, keep me talking. I got two more things to answer here. Um, so this is an interesting one. Charles is asking me about my three volume set here uh, about the ideological history of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, I would recommend this. Um, what I found to be fascinating about this is that that throughout the three volumes, and this is actually a Chinese Communist Party book that's been translated, right? This is not, you know, somebody's, um, somebody, some Westerners interpretation, right? The first volume is about before the revolution uh, and the, the leadership, the, the lead up to taking power. The second volume is about the Mao era. And the third volume is from the Deng era to now. And what is fascinating about it is that you can see that the Chinese Communist Party, its worldview has been 
frequently changing, but frequently staying the same. And that is what is fascinating about it, that their overall mission to create a prosperous society in China, to lead China toward that ultimate goal of communism and vast abundance, that's never changed. Um, but what has changed is their understanding of how to get there, but also the circumstances have changed and that there's been so many different alliances and there's been so many different, uh, I mean, it, it's fascinating. It's really, really fascinating history. Um, you know, and that this, this volume represents the current view in China. You, a lot of people think they can understand communism in China by reading old Mao era books, right? Um, and you can't, that's wrong, right? A lot has changed. The Cultural Revolution in China is viewed in a largely negative light at this point. Now, there's starting to be a little bit of a shift back to the, the neo-Maoist stuff, but largely people think the Cultural Revolution was not a good thing. Um, you know, and that it's it's complicated. These things are complicated. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's that's one thing I would like to, um, you know, to highlight. I I I learned a lot from that. I've quoted that volume. Uh, you know, it's it's I've quoted it in different things I've written. Uh, I recommend that official history, uh, ideological history of the Chinese Communist Party. All righty. Thank you, Charles. Um, uh, the Kremlin. Oh, this is the official link. Thank you, John McCarthy, for posting the official link to the the remarks of Russian President Vladimir Putin. And I don't see any rumble rants or uh, any more rumble rants. And I don't see any more Rockfin tips and I don't see any more super chats. So if anyone has anything else they would like to say or like me to talk about, uh, now would be the time. Uh, you know, uh, I could probably go for a little while longer here. We're just over the two hour mark. Um, but I will take this time uh, to remind you all of how important our December conference is going to be. Um, this is the December conference uh, that we are having is going to be pretty gosh darn important. Um, so I want to remind you all to mark your calendars, uh, to make your travel arrangements. Um, you know, we need you there right? Everything that I talked about in the opening of the stream, out of the movement to the masses, lower and deeper to the real masses. We got to start putting it into practice. The internet is tapped out. The internet laid the basis for what we're doing here, but now is the time to build a real organization, um, lower and deeper to the real masses. That is the urgency of now. The masses are with us. They're against these wars. They, the, the, at this point, we just saw in Congress the removal of Kevin McCarthy and that the, the demand of the people, money for American jobs and schools and housing instead of war, instead of a war on in Ukraine, uh, that demand is is like being you know implemented with a vengeance. Um, so I would really, really urge you. I would really, really urge you, uh, if you can, uh, to try and make it to our conference. I would really, really urge you to to try and attend our upcoming conference if you can. Um, you know, um, and, uh, you know, um, if you would like to help us do the conference, you know, if you can't make it or you can make it, but you just want to help us, here's the donate link, right? Here's the donate link. Um, and it goes directly. This is the account managed by our president, Elizabeth Young. Uh, you know, so, you know, if you, if, if you're worried that that this money is going to help me smoke crack or something, yeah, that's not happening because I don't have access to these accounts. These are the direct CPI accounts run by Elizabeth Young. Um, you know, and this is this is the, you know, the Portland conference. Um, and uh, yeah, we need your help. We need you to be there. Um, there's going to be a lot of different people who play a very vital role in this upcoming conference. So if you can support our conference, if you understand how important it will be to have a major anti-imperialist rally to close out the year, an all-day anti-imperialist gathering, uh, if you can understand that, then you will you will give us a contribution and you will be there, right? Because we need you. And a lot of people have been saying things to me like, oh, well, I can't come. And I said, no, I think you can, right? You can come, right? It might be hard for you. But if you make the decision, if you really, really want to be there, right? you can find a way to get there, right? Not everyone, look, and it may not be in your life circumstances, it may not be worth it for you to get there, but don't say you can't come. You can, 
right? But the question is, it'll be much harder for you than for other people, right? That's the issue there, right? And, and maybe it will be harder for you. For some people who live there, right? Terry lives there. Elizabeth Young lives there. They can easily attend, right? People on the other side of the country, a little bit harder. People that maybe economically, it's harder for them to travel, but but you can do it, right? And that I do want to say this, right? There is something, and I see the two more super chats that are here, and I will, I will get to them. And any anything else people want me to talk about, right? I'm ready, willing to keep going here for a little bit. I want to say this: that there's something to be said for taking dramatic moves. There's something to be said for doing something you would not normally do. There's something to be said for you know what? I am gonna do something I wouldn't normally do. Right. There's something you said for breaking your routine. Right. A lot of people, they just get into this this rut in life where they're just like, you know what? This is what I do. I work this job. I live in this town. I, I do this. And then something comes along. And says, hey, you know, there's a big conference, big revolutionary anti-imperialist conference happening in Portland, Oregon. In December, you know, I can go to it. And then everything in them says, no, I can't go to it because I have to, I have to go to this place. I have to do this. I, I can't go to it. But if you can actually make yourself go to it, if you can break your routine, that could be the opening to giving you a whole new life, right? Now this conference itself, don't get me wrong. This conference is not going to give you a whole new life. But if you don't like your life as it is now, Right. If you feel like you're in a rut. Right. Alex says you need to get out of our comfort zone. Exactly. If you feel like you're in a rut, part of what keeps you in a rut is your comfort zone. That is the truth, right? That that part of what keeps you in a rut is your comfort zone is not. Doing bold, unprecedented things. Right. Um, and. If you want to get out of the rut that you're in, right? If you want to, you know, if you want to bring a new level of energy to your life, sometimes that means going out of your way to do something you would not normally do. Something that seems like it might even be impossible, but just push, push the boundaries, the artificial boundaries in your life and do it. And that can be the opening to being much more satisfied with yourself. That could be the opening to fulfilling your potential and having a much more satisfying life. Right? And I remember when I was in college, there were so many people I knew who had big dreams and aspirations. And then when it was time to actually put them into practice, oh, they, they had something else to do. And I would get so frustrated with these people. I would get so frustrated with these people because it seemed like they were all, they, they just, there was something in their spirit that when it was time to actually take off, take the plunge, right? They just didn't have the oomph, you know, and that they just, they had this routine. Now my life is here. I do this, I go to this college, I live in this town, I gotta, well, I gotta go to this thing, my parents are doing this thing, if I miss dinner with my parents on this date, it's gonna be the end of the world. No, it's not gonna be the end of the world, right? And that so many people were just so attached to these artificial, this artificial cage they had put themselves in. And they like to talk about ideas. They like to think about communism. They like to think about opposing wars. They like to think about anti-imperialism. They like to read history books about stuff, but they live in this artificial cage they've made for themselves. And when it's actually time to take the plunge, that's a good way of putting it, Jenny. All of a sudden, they can't do it. And I feel so sorry for those people. I feel so sorry for them. Because they're going to be disappointed in themselves one day. They're going to look back on their life 40 years from now and they're going to go, oh, shit, what have I done? I've just kind of stayed in my cage. Just kind of stayed in my bird cage. You know, well, you know, 
I'm giving you an opportunity here. You know, and it's not going to be easy. I'm not I'm not paying you to come. Right. I'm not you know, I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not, you know, going out of my way to, you know, to make it make it easy for you to get there. I'm not bribing you to come. But I'm telling you that, you know, if you're the kind of person who feels like your life is kind of a, you know, kind of stuck in a rut. The first thing you need to change is the thing where you just kind of stay in the rut. I mean, that sounds kind of like common sense, you know, but a lot of people don't get that. A lot of people are like, my, my life sucks. I'm lonely. I'm depressed. My life isn't going anywhere. And, you know, and and a lot of people feel that way. Those feelings are kind of universal almost in the United States since the pandemic. Right. You know, but a lot of people, they get into this this place in their mind where they're like, oh, everything sucks. I don't like it. And it's like someone comes along and says, well, then change it. Well, then. You know, maybe instead of just, uh, you know, going home and playing video games this weekend, uh, you know, maybe you should uh, go to the uh, the conference in Oregon. And they say, well, I can't do that. I have to go home and play video games this weekend. And um, and then you say, well, then why are you upset that you're stuck in a rut? You know, I, and that's how a lot of people are They're They're in a rut, but the rut is comfortable. This is so dangerous. Right, this is why people stay in unhealthy relationships. Right? They they have a, a partner who doesn't make them happy. But then they'd have to be single again. If they're single again, they they might date people and it might not go well. And right now they got the whole partner thing covered and they want to stay with it. That's really common. That's why people stay in jobs they don't like. Right? They hate their job, they hate their boss, but you know, looking for a new job, going to interviews, they might get their feelings hurt, they might get rejected, they, you know, they might be embarrassed, so they just, they just stay in that job that they hate. And it's a really, really big problem. It's a really, really big problem. And I see it all the time. I'm just being honest with you. I'm being blatant, and I am not talking about any individual in here. So if this applies to you, look, I don't know your life, right? I mean, I know a few people's lives, but this is not an attack on anybody in here. So please don't misinterpret this. Right. Um, you know, um, you know, um, but I know a lot of people who love this kind of content, you know, they love this kind of, these kind of videos, these kind of streams and stuff like that. They love it. Um, they love this kind of content and they love to talk about history and they love to read books on their computer, but then they have a life they're not happy about. They're not living an exciting life. They're not having adventures. They're not involved in exciting. They're not taking history into their own hands. They're not doing what all the people they read about. And they're unsatisfied with their life. And every so often they might have a fantasy in their head. Oh, I want to be a revolutionary. Oh, I'm going to. But it's just a fantasy. But then in order for them to actually see some action in life in order for them to actually get the fulfillment that they want in order them for them to not just sit in this cycle of my life sucks, my life sucks. That requires them to do some things that aren't easy, like figuring out how they can get things together to get to a conference on the other side of the country. You know, now, that conference isn't going to change your life in and of itself, but it might lead it might lead to a new way of interacting with yourself. You'll meet people who you've never met before. You'll be in a room full of people with ideological and political views that are similar to yours, that are putting into practice a strategy to actually carry those views out. You'll meet people who've been to other countries. You'll be able, you know, to, to do outreach. I mean, it, it could be something that actually kind of awakens a part of you that's more energized. It could be an opportunity. It could be the beginning of you getting out of your rut. I'm just throwing that out there because this applies to, there are many people watching this right now who are in a rut in their life and they hate the rut they're in, but there's just something inside of them that says, oh, I got to stay in this rut. Got to stay in this rut. Classic example. Classic example, right? One person who was an ex CPI member, right? Um, you know, they um, 
they wanted to go on the trip to Nicaragua with us. And I said, great. All right, let's do it. And then they said, oh, I don't think I can afford it. And I said, well, you know, we can fundraise. And he said, well, I just, I don't think I have the money. And I said, well, we can fundraise. Um, and so we went out and fundraised. And we came back and I said, we have the money. And so we had the money for them to go on the trip. And, uh, and I was kind of frustrated with them. I said, why did you just say you couldn't do it when, I mean, we can fundraise. You know, I mean, it was about $500 for the plane tickets there and back. But, you know, we can do that. So we went out and raised the money. And then in the lead up to it, the person was like, oh, I don't think I got the COVID test right. And I said, well, there's somebody else on our trip who's had an issue with their test. So, you know, we may have to get have a holdover day in Mexico City, uh, you know, but that's fine. And they're like, no, I don't think I have it. And then they just stayed home. What a sad person. What a pathetic you know, it's like we're literally opening doors for you, you know. And then this person, of course, texts me as soon as I'm back from Nicaragua. My life sucks. Can't you get me a better job, Caleb? Well, you know, um, you know, I mean, maybe I can't get you a better job, but I did basically arrange a, a free trip for you to Nicaragua. And you skipped out on the trip and left us with a bill. Yeah, I mean, it's like I can't. I can't do it for you. And that's been one of my biggest, biggest, biggest mistakes. Okay. There are some people that are just in a rut and they don't want to break out of the rut. Right. And if you open doors for them and they, and they, and you kind of carry them along to walk through them, eventually they'll just resent you. So I can't get you out of your rut. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I can't get you out of your rut. Only you can get yourself out of the rut. You have to make a decision. I want to get out of the rut I'm in. I want to push my boundaries. I want to I want to do what I know I'm capable of doing, but part of me just doesn't have the willpower. I want to break my routine. You have to make that decision. And if I do it for you, if I do it for you, you're going to hate me. Right? Um so you know, if you're watching this and you don't like the rut you're in and you want something exciting, I think you should make arrangements to come to our conference in Portland, Oregon. That's what I think you should do. You know, if you're a CPI member, um, you know, we can probably, you know, help coordinate if you want to come up a few days beforehand or afterwards or whatever. If you're just a member of the public, you know, figure it all out yourself. But I think you, if, if you are in a rut, I would encourage you. Look, to, it's only, what what is today? Today is, it just turned October 6th. It is October 6th. The conference is December 2nd. You got loads of time. Loads of time. Right? Um, Sam, you make me smile. That was that was a good line, right? I am I am in popular I am popular uh, I I I am familiar with popular music enough to get that joke, Sam, and I do appreciate it. That is a that's a, that is good. That was very funny, very very funny, Sam. I that was funny. I you put a smile on my face. That was the best one liner of the night. Cheers to you, Sam. That was funny. All right, uh, but anyway, I think I've made my point. I've made my point. So what's the pathway to turn anarchists into tankies? Hmm. I think first, the first thing is you have to find out why they're anarchists. Um, right. I mean, because anarchism with anarchists, there's a lot of different varieties. A lot of anarchism is very hippie hippieism. Uh, a lot of anarchism is, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be associated with communism. I don't want the legacy of communism. I basically have a communist perspective, but I don't want to be associated with, I don't want to have to defend Stalin. So I want to say, well, I'm an anarchist. Some anarchism is, is just kind of lifestyleism. It's not very political. You have to find out what kind of anarchists there are. The main thing is you need to find out what, what is in it for them. And this is, goes with any, any political conversion. Why? What is in it for them? All right, this person says, I am an anarchist. Why do they say that? What is in anarchism for them that has driven them to seek that identity? 
What is it? You know, I mean, is there something? There's something there. And um, once you find out what that something is, that would be the key toward changing it. But until you, you find out why that person has chosen to be an anarchist, right? You really don't have any potential to change them. And I will say that, that with a lot of people who are anarchists, I mean, I don't, I don't know. This is a broad generalization. A lot of people nowadays who call themselves anarcho-communists or, or whatever, what it's about is that this is a sexy internet ideology they learned about. They learned about it on BreadTube. They learned about the way to be a communist or an anarchist and not get canceled is to be like Vosh, to be an anarcho-communist or whatever. And the, the, the real cure for that kind of person is to engage them in real political work. All right? You know, is to, if CPI was mobilizing people for a cause they agreed with, despite their, right? If they were, if they were an, an anarcho-communist, but they understood money for Ukraine was bad. They didn't want to fund the Nazis in Ukraine. If CPI could mobilize them to be involved in a day of action to protest money for Ukraine, could, could involve them in some kind of activity where they were working with people who weren't anarchists, who were tankies, to carry it out. And then, meanwhile, the people on the internet that are anarchists were not friendly to them, whereas they found a very rewarding experience working with a group of tankies to carry it out, that would ultimately be the way to change them. And a lot of times when people become tankies, historically, it's because a tanky group shows up in their life. Um, a tanky group shows up in their life and they do shit with it. And doing that shit with the tanky group gives them, you know, the experience of being in a community. And then they understand the ideology of the group. And that's why people joined the Communist Party back in the day. That's why people joined, you know, Progressive Labor Party or the Students for a Democratic Society in the 60s. Um, you know, and I mean, even the little fringe groups, Workers World, Revolutionary Communist Party, you know, you know, Freedom Road Socialist Organization. It tends to be, or at least it used to be, maybe even now, it's because they they get involved in what the group is doing. They, they get caught up in that momentum that I talk about in my book. And that's generally the way communist groups with tanky hardline ideology, that's the way they recruit, is they create momentum. They create momentum and people who don't agree with them get caught up in that momentum and they like the momentum and then that gets them to adopt the ideology. That's generally how these things are done. Um, and I will say this, look, uh, communist groups are best when they're in motion, right? When they have a cause that they are fighting for, when they have a day of action that they're building for, when they have a goal, that's when communist groups are healthy internally. That's when people get along with each other. That's when they, they, that's when, that's when shit is going well. That's when they're expanding their ranks and recruiting, et cetera. Communist groups start falling apart when they're not doing anything, when they don't have goals. That's when they start bickering with each other. That's when they start blaming each other for shortcomings. And that's when they start to fall apart. And that applies to every communist or activist group I've been in. Knocking on doors from, from made you a tanky. Right, exactly. Right. You, you were engaged in some kind of activity. Right. Um, and that that's the secret to it. And that's, you know, I mean, uh, you know, this, this is again, communist groups are functional and healthy when they're doing stuff. And generally people that have some kind of weird Internet ideology or whatever, and then an actual communist group shows up and involves them in doing actual stuff. Then they will shed that Internet ideology and they'll they'll adopt the ideology of the group of people that are involving them in doing actual stuff. Uh, that's generally how it's done. Um, so, you know, that's my experience. That that's I hope that helps you, uh, Killian. I hope that that's a good answer. Well, earlier on the stream, Lori, I talked about how I agree with Nick Brana's assessment. This is this is essentially Cornell West dropping out of the race. 
Um, you know, because now he won't be on the ballot anywhere. Right. I mean, supposedly the reason he adopted the Green Party campaign was so he could be on the ballot. Um, he could have their ballot line. That's why, oh, the People's Party is not on the ballot. Yeah, but the People's Party has a network of volunteers who would go out and petition and get him on the ballot and all that. Well, he quit the People's Party. Now he's quit the, the Green Party and, and he's he's a non-candidate now. Uh, he's a write-in. He, it's And it's very sad. It's sad. Um, you know, RFK is a different story. RFK running independent. You have to remember that RFK, right, he has a base, a well-organized base of volunteers. So, you know, even though he's running independent, he could still get himself on the ballot. But for Cornell, I, I agree with uh, Nick Brana. It's just the cry of defeat uh, for Cornell West. Um, and it's, it's very sad. But, you know, we saw from his falling out with, with Jimmy Dore and others, he won't break with wokeness, right? The idea that the Trumpers are the worst, you know, that's just something Cornell West, you can't not say that. You have to say that in these circles. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't break with that, right? He, he wouldn't break with the idea that Trump is the worst. Trump is a fascist. Trump is a, you know, I mean, you know, and this idea that the Trump is worse, you know, I mean, if you think Trump is worse, why would you run? You know, why would you run in the election? So, yeah, I think, I think, Laurie, to answer your question, I agree with Nick Brown's analysis. That was just him dropping out. Thoughts on Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera. Well, Diego Rivera was a Trotskyite. Um, I believe he was with the right opposition um, and he was a Trotskyite, but he was a famous painter. It was associated with labor and worker causes, uh, but he had a, a very strong disagreement with the Mexican Communist Party and he was associated with the right opposition, the Bukharanites, and later with Trotsky. Um, he made some amazing paintings. He was a social realist painter. Amazing, amazing painting in Detroit. If you have an opportunity to go to the Detroit Institute of Art and look at his painting for the auto workers, it's very amazing. Great murals, great murals that he made. Um, you know, Frida Kahlo, uh, her art is somewhat pessimistic, I will say. A lot of her paintings, um, there's kind of a sad undertone. I mean, she was disabled, she'd been in an accident, you know, but she was a feminist and such. What I think is particularly interesting about Frida Kahlo, you know, everyone makes a big deal out of the fact that she probably had an affair with Trotsky. Now, in the movie, they they have a whole thing. We don't know exactly what happened. OK, we do know Trotsky's wife and Frida had a big falling out. Frida was known to be promiscuous. So people assume that that means that that she and Trotsky banged. I don't know if that necessarily happened or not. What we do know, though, is that after Trotsky moved out of the place she was staying, she turned viciously against Trotsky, so much so that when Trotsky was killed, she was investigated by the Mexican police uh, for possibly being complicit in the killing. And that if you go to her house today on her bed, she has Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao. And after, after Trotsky's death and after Trotsky moved out of her, her place, she became a hardline Stalinist. Um, so, you know, and she even painted a picture of herself with Stalin. Um, she painted self with Stalin. Um, and she, she really liked Mao. She had big pictures of Mao everywhere and that she became, you know, after she had her falling out with Diego and after, you know, she had her falling out with Trotsky, she, she was a hardliner in her final years. Right. Um, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, in the fifties, you know, the fifties, that was before the Khrushchev revelations. That was kind of the golden era. Right. When Stalin was in the final years of his life, when William Z. Foster was running the Communist Party in America, the Communist Party was um, the Communist Party was was pretty underground during those years. But internationally, that was kind of the heyday of communism before the, you know, the the Khrushchev secret speech, the global communist movement marched as one. Stalin was the leader. Uh, the communist camp was expanding globally, like the early 50s. Um, and I believe that's when she died, right? Didn't she? Die? What year did she die? Right? Uh, what year did she die? Right? Right? I mean, those years when she was when she went full full Stalinist, when she became like a full full communist. Yeah, she died in 1954. Those were the years um, when you know when the global communist movement was at its height. Right? The, the Khrushchev revelations hadn't happened yet. They had won World War II. They had come out of World War II strong. The people's democracies of Eastern Europe were riding high and industrializing. China had had its communist revolution, was victorious. And 
I mean, those were the periods where, you know, McCarthyism was based on this real fear that, I mean, the floodwaters were rising. Capitalism was on its way out, you know? And I mean, that was a period where globally it really looked like we were winning. Um, and for her to do that, that she wasn't the only one, right? If you look at that period outside the United States, McCarthyism in the United States obviously, you know, made it very difficult, but outside the United States, you know, Picasso, Albert Einstein, I mean, you know, you go down the list, famous intellectuals, famous writers, they were all saying, this is, this is the way the wind is blowing. The communists are going to win, you know, um, you know, and that was, you know, Stalin had led them through the dark storm. He, you know, he'd driven out the Nazi invaders. China had had a communist revolution, the people's democracies. And, you know, the books from that period, that's when William Z. Foster wrote all his big history volumes, history of the three internationals, you know, history of the, of the American communist party, history of black people in America, history, uh, outline political history of the Americas. And, you know, that was the time when, uh, those were the years when, uh, you know, when, when global communism was kind of riding high and, uh, you know, for her it, as a Mexican artist to, you know, become a Stalinist that, you know, that there was nothing particularly, uh, you know, unique about that, you know? Um, I mean, it really isn't a shocking thing. Um, and based on the way things were lining up that, you know, that made per perfect sense. So there you go. There you go. All right. I hope that that answers your question, Victory Jen. And on that note, I think we will um, put on the closing music. Uh, so thanks, everybody. I don't know if I'm going to stream over the weekend or not. I, I feel like part of my break from social media might also be a break from streaming, but I'm not sure yet. I will definitely be back on Sunday when Angela and I stream. That's definitely happening. Not going to miss an opportunity to talk to the chairwoman of the Libertarian Party. Uh, so that'll be... Uh, happening for sure. Um, but maybe between now and then I'll take time off. Maybe not though. Maybe I'll be back tomorrow night. I don't know. Depends how I'm feeling. I need to just take some time because all the drama and all of that is, you know, gotta, gotta take some time. You know, the weather's changing and I'm focused on Portland and I'm trying to get a vision for Portland to make sure Portland goes well, right. Trying to keep track of different things. So stay strong, everyone. I'm out. Upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. And while the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. And John McCarthy for the win, right? I'm not sure if that's funnier than the uh, the uh, the whole uh, uh, joke about big ruts ruts uh, from Sam, but that's a pretty good one too. Got to keep it lighthearted, everybody. Sense of humor is a good thing in our times. Thanks, John. Much love to all of you all. I love you guys. Remember that. Talk to you soon.